challenges and solutions for a digital age. My name is Parisa Amiri, I'm a Swedish journalist, and I will be presenting the speakers and the panels here today, as well as managing the many, many questions. I hope you all are eager to ask our very prominent guests. I will keep reminding you. And also, we have an online audience with us through these uh, very digital uh, contemporary cameras. You can barely see them, but they are with us, and they will have questions through the chat, I hope. I would remind you as well. And gathered, as you may know, are experts from academia and NGOs, as well as representatives of institutions, corporations such as Meta, Google, the United Nations, all with a crucial responsibility on how we manage these issues and their specific platforms. So the subjects and presentations today will encompass many of the contemporary headaches regarding free speech and digital platforms, but with necessary innovative and creative solutions. And this initiative has been made possible with funds by the Swedish po Postcard Lottery. We will dive into that more uh, soon. But now, to understand this urgent matter of the regression of free speech, relevant for both oppressive and democratic societies, and the many tools that are at hand, I will introduce a central person for this day, that will do his first presentation. The executive director of the Future of Free Speech project organizing this day, please welcome Jacob Mashangama. Thank you so much, Parisa. Um, do I have a clicker for the uh, PowerPoint? Um, otherwise, I'll can live without it. Um, but good morning uh, to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, so many of you here. Um, as Parisa said, my name is Jakob Mishangama. I'm the executive director of the Future of Free Speech Project. And I am very excited to welcome you today to this conference on the state of free speech, challenges and solutions for a digital age. First, a little bit about the Future of Free Speech Project. Uh, we're a free speech-oriented think tank. Um, we're based at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, but also uh, have an office in, in Copenhagen, Denmark, where I'm from and where we started out. Um, and our mission is to create a resilient and flourishing global culture of free speech. And I very much hope that today's event can uh, help contribute to that mission. I also want to say that I am very, very grateful to our generous donors, especially the Swedish Postcode Foundation, uh, who has made this conference uh, possible. And I, of course, want to thank each and every one of you who are in the room today, um, and especially our esteemed speakers. Some of them have traveled a very long time to be with us. Uh, and I think that your presence signifies uh, a collective commitment uh, towards safeguarding free speech in this rapidly evolving digital age. It seems like a year ago, everyone was talking about content moderation on social media. Today, everyone is talking about AI and, uh, and, and, and content moderation seems to be uh, 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 something from, from a different age. I also want to say that I think that it's um, very fitting that we gather here in Stockholm, Sweden because Sweden is a nation that pioneered the first ever legal protection of uh, free expression with the Swedish Press Freedom Act of 1766, a very seminal moment in the history of free, free speech uh, during what I love is called the Age of Liberty uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Swedish uh, history. Now, of course, I am Danish. Dan Denmark and Sweden has a, has, has a long rivalry. Uh, I, don't, I, I actually think no, no two countries have been more frequently at war with each other than, than Denmark and Sweden. That is uh, probably not on the horizon. Uh, luckily, one of the reasons is that we, we speak to each other rather than, than, than go to war, another benefit of free speech. But of course, Denmark was not to be outrivaled by, by Sweden. So by, in 1770, Denmark became the first country in the world to abolish any and all censorship, um, um, which went further than, than the Swedish Press Freedom Act, which had some ifs and buts. But these um, Scandinavian experiments with free speech were short-lived. Um, relatively soon, um, um, 
absolutist rulers regained control of the, the presses in, uh, in Scandinavia. And you can see what happened to uh, the guy who introduced um, free, uh, who abolished censorship in Denmark, uh, Strunze, who was, uh, who, who, who ruled uh, in the name of the, our insane king. He was uh, beheaded uh, publicly uh, and his dismembered uh, body was displayed uh, publicly all around uh, the country. Um, so, um, a great start in Scandinavia for free speech, but it didn't go uh, this this well. And I think this is a his, this is a um, a stark reminder of the fragility of uh, free speech and the constant vigilance required to preserve them, because free speech is never really won or lost. It's a precious but very difficult and sometimes counterintuitive principle. Uh, that needs constant vigilance in, in order to flourish and thrive. And almost in, invariably, the introduction of free speech sets in motion a process of entropy. And the leaders of any political system, no matter how enlightened, convince themselves that now freedom of speech has gone too far. And if 1766 seems distant, the echo uh, of uh, history uh, resonates uh, today, unfortunately, even within the open democracies that many of us are lucky to live in. And the year 2023 uh, has, been, um, ha has been quite worrying in that regard. Um, who, the guy you see here is called Cherry Breton. He is the, uh, a European commissioner who has uh, been very aggressive in policing the so-called global gold standard for online regulation, the Digital Services Act, the DSA, sending a flurry of letters to various platforms uh, um, with um, sometimes um, rather broad uh, characterizations of what may uh, or may not be uh, illegal uh, content that he thinks uh, should be uh, removed, which uh, I think um, is, 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 is a, worrying, um, a worrying debut for uh, the Digital Services Act. And we see similar inspirations, a Brussels effect of the Digital Services Act being spread to, to other democracies, Costa Rica, uh, Chile, uh, Taiwan, uh, are, are on the list. Um, in in 2020, it looked as if the crime of blasphemy would be uh, a thing of the past in open democracy. A wave of countries, New Zealand, Canada, uh, Ireland, Greece, um, had repealed their, their blasphemy bans. That included my own home country of Denmark. I'm glad to say that I played a part in that in 2017. But um, this year, the Danish government uh, has reintroduced uh, a, a new blasphemy ban in order to counter the admittedly pernicious phenomenon of Quran burnings that far-right activists have been engaging in on a pyromaniacal scale in, in, uh, in, in, Co in, in Copenhagen and Stockholm, among other uh, places. Um, and this is a huge retrograde uh, step. Um, no one has been convicted of blasphemy in Denmark since 1946, and the, the law was ab abolished in 2017. And of course, marks a contrast to here in Sweden, where the government has said that it will not uh, reintroduce the crime of blasphemy, even though uh, the, uh, these Quran burnings have contributed to uh, the difficulties of Sweden of, of getting into Na to NATO and, and real national security threats. And the Danish government's position is also undermining efforts at the United Nations, where for a very long time, countries have fought against um, the uh, idea that blasphemy should be a crime uh, prohibited under international human rights law. We have also seen places like Italy and Chile where um, Journalists are now being uh, convicted for criminal defamation, including in Italy, where a journalist has been convicted for criti criticizing the president, in Chile for, for, for criticizing a, a public official. Um, the, um, the Hamas attack on Israel on, on, on 7th October and the ensuing war has led to countries like France and Germany introducing very broad uh, crackdowns on, uh, on protest, uh, banning pro-Palestinian uh, um, demonstrations uh, as, as such. 
In Australia, the government is proposing a sweeping misinformation bill uh, that will have far-reaching consequences for press freedom. And in Ireland, a new hate speech bill is set to criminalize the mere possession of hateful uh, material, which could include memes or GIFs uh, downloaded on mobile phones or laptops. And these are stark reminders of the precarious state of free speech in our current time. And that does not even include the even more dark developments in illiberal democracies, authoritarian states, and dictatorships where imprisonment and killing of journalists, dissidents, and protesters is an all too common phenomenon. So what does that say of our time when even the open democracies that are supposed to be uh, um, fighting for, for, for free speech um, are increasingly um, not doing so? And unfortunately, Unfortunately, 2023 was not the exception to the rule. Um, today, we are publishing at the Future of Free Speech a new report that covers development affecting free speech in 22 open democracies across the globe based on, on contributions by experts. Some of you uh, we're, we're very lucky to have in the room today. Um, covering countries like Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea and Asia, South Africa, Chile, Costa Rica, and Uruguay in Latin America, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the US, as well as 10 European democracies and the European Union. Um, and the picture emerging uh, is, is pretty alarming. So 78% uh, of the developments uh, identified by our experts were speech restricted, were speech restrictive, with 2022 marking the most restrictive year um, uh, surveyed. Um, and we see developments, uh, restrictive developments on, on everything from criminal defamation law, expanding hate speech and terrorism legislation, even national cohesion, uh, stringent online liability regimes, and broad and vague prohibitions against disinformation, as well as restrictions on the right to peaceful protest in some of the most open democracies of the world. Um, so, um, this is, um, I believe, a critical time for, for free expression, and that's why we're so delighted um, that um, you are here to discuss some of these uh, uh, developments. Um, and I think no country or no, no example of, of what can happen when, um, t when you undermine free expression uh, and how effective that can be to undermine representative government and the rule of law uh, is the very tragic fate of Hong Kong. And we're very lucky to have Kamen Lau here to can, who can demonstrate uh, and can talk to what happens when you use censorship and repression as a wrecking ball uh, uh, to be unleashed against, uh, against democracy. Uh, I think uh, Carmen's insights will offer us a reminder of the stakes involved in our fight for free speech. Of course, it's true that democracies today grapple with challenges that are magnified, amplified by the digital age, from foreign propaganda campaigns, the spread of hatred and terrorism. Uh, and these issues are complex, and there is a, and a sometimes understandable temptation to suppress speech as a quick, quick uh, fix. Um, but we, I think it's, it's also crucial that we resist this knee-jerk um, reaction. And um, no one, I think, has thought more about this subject in the digital age than Professor David Kay, who previously served as UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Opinion, and who has pioneered standard setting for digitally connected uh, world. Um, and so we're glad that, that David uh, will, will be speaking to us today as well. Unfortunately, um, these standards are too often honored in the breach, and, uh, and democracies contribute to this development, as, as I've mentioned. We will also hear from UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief, Nazila Ghanea, uh, on how the millennia old tensions between religious doctrines and free expression is still with us in the 21st century, and why we should view the freedoms of religion and expression as complementary rather than mutually exclusive. But in a world where the harms of free speech are more visible uh, than ever, I think it's crucial that advocates for free speech must do more than just offer legal analysis or principled arguments. That's 
crucially important. But if we are to convince an increasingly skeptical world of the merits of the right to speak and receive information freely across borders, we need to demonstrate, to show that free speech remains the bulwark of liberty, the foundation of democracy, and a precondition for equality and tolerance. And today's conference will uh, hopefully include some contributions towards that. You will hear from pioneers of counter-speech, activists and scholars who have bravely confronted hatred using their voices. We will showcase the Frequalizer, an AI-powered counter-speech tool developed in col collaboration with Vanderbilt University's Data Science Institute and designed to empower counter-speech uh, at scale. We will hear from a Middle Eastern refugee from Iraq who is enabling access to literature in local languages across the region. You will hear from experts on online dis disinformation discussing alternatives to the problematic trend of government-controlled truth determination. So as we embark on today's session, uh, let us be inspired by the rich tapestry of ideas and hopefully also solutions that will be shared. Uh, and let us recommend, recommit to the principle that free speech does not just inform democracies, it is the very lifeblood that sustains them. And yes, free speech can sometimes be ugly. This freedom comes with costs and harms. But if we want democracy to flourish in the 21st century, a robust commitment to this freedom should be seen as part of the solution, not the problem. So with that, I will say thank you. And uh, I think there might be a few questions uh, from Parisa and maybe the audience, and then we can get on. Perfect. Yeah. Right about now, the microphone kicks in. Yes, you are, this is a very interesting range. Thank you for recognizing Sweden's uh, very early recognition of this issue and how important it is. But I'm asking you, um, this also shows the importance of regulation. Some think that uh, free speech demands that uh, governing is com it's completely lawless. Mm. It has nothing to do with governments or regulations at all. What do you say to that? No, I, I, I don't believe any serious person is in favor of free speech absolutism. Um, there, there, there are definitely types of speech that all democracies, you know, there's often this uh, dichotomy between U.S. and Europe, so U.S. having a more speech protective um, commitment to, to free speech, but, but also in the U.S. there are definitely categories of speech uh, that is uh, prohibited. Threats, incitement to violence, um, fraud, perjury, you can come, come up with all kinds of, uh, of, of, of types of speech. So, so the, our position is not that there should be no limits on free speech, that governments have nothing to do with, with free speech. As I mentioned, there are international standards, but I think the, 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 the development today, even in, within democracies, is that, these, that, that the restrictions on free speech are being expanded, that some of the standards that have been adopted um, are increasingly not being observed. Um, this is, is very clear, for instance, when it comes to UN standards on, on free speech. So, so that when the Danish government is, try, is, is, is criminalizing blasphemy, that goes against the recognized, um, the, the, the recognized uh, prohibition on, on blasphemy laws under international human rights law. Um, so this is uh, a, a problematic trend. Uh, and it, it's also not the case that you know, free speech should be protected to the exact same extent everywhere around the globe. But I think that the, um, the trend is very clear that for a long time, for more than a decade, I would say, free speech has been in retreat. Uh, and I think, uh, and, and in many democracies, this is not a dramatic development. It's not like Denmark is turning into Iran or, or Russia. But I think it will have long-term consequences that if open democracies over a sustained period of time uh, adopts more and more speech restrictions, then ultimately there will be different societies two, three, four decades down the road than they were before. Um, and I think this is likely to have very dangerous long-term consequences for free and open democracies. And also those regulations coming into hands of authoritarian regimes that the future might bring, yes. not mentioning any uh, particular parties in any nations, but I think you can do your, the math by yourselves. Uh, and you mentioned the banning of protests. Some of these protests have been about killing civilian Palestinians. It has not been necessarily pro-Hamas, which has 
been some of the discussions around this. What do you think will be the consequences from uh, such uh, like that handling, banning protests in that way? What could that be? Yes, this is, uh, I mean, uh, a country like Germany, uh, for historical reasons, is uh, obviously very concerned about any expression uh, of uh, anti-Semitism. But I think we, we've seen Germany now for a, very, for, for a long time um, taking the, the road that threats to national cohesion, to its, to its, to its constitutional commitment to, to democracy, which is laudable. I want to say that to the Germans in, here in the room, but that more and more restrictions on free speech is the way to, to, to go about that. And I think that um, it's, it, it sets a, a dangerous uh, precedent. Um, so, you know, you, have, you, have, you, you certainly have stringent hate speech laws in, in Germany and France, countries that have cracked down on pro-Palestinian protests. So you can punish people for having said anti-Semitic things or for you know, endangering public safety. But if you adopt blanket bans against protests, then you open up um, the door for governments in the future to, uh, to ban all kinds of other uh, uh, protests. And I think it's important that people, you know, the antithesis to violence, I believe, is, is free speech. So you, wanna, you want people in democracies to be able to protest against what they perceive to be injustice and do so uh, peacefully rather than using violence. And peaceful and, and, and protest demonstrations is an important means of that. So governments should be very careful about doing that. And blanket bans that sort of say that one side uh, of, of a conflict cannot demonstrate publicly is, I think, a very dangerous development. Regardless of method and actual opinion. Yeah. Uh, this is very interesting. We could stand here all day, but uh, we have actually guests here with us. So I'd say thank you to Jacob, and we'll see you later today. Thank, thank you. you. We'll carry on with the program. Uh, tonight, uh, I might actually, uh, there she is, hello. Now we have uh, a person that is very crucial for making this day possible. From the Swedish Post Cal Code Foundation, we have Marie Dala for a few welcome notes. Welcome, Marie Dala. Thank you. I could actually start talking. It's okay. Well, there I am, both on screen and live. Um, dear friends, including uh, our Danish friends, it's interesting to hear that we have the countries that have been most at war with each other, but good thing, we, it's way in the past and we're now dear friends. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you all to Stockholm. It's, uh, today is the scene of frost and snow, and I hope everyone's kept on their feet. It's quite slippery out there. But it's also, like Jacob said, it's the scene for a quite a lively debate on the freedom of speech and free speech due to the Quran burnings that's been happening in Sweden lately. Um, I'm from the Swedish Postcode Foundation and we are a committed funder of uh, freedom of sp free speech and uh, democracy and all questions concerning democracy. In the past, we have supported organizations working to support and protect free media, uncover misbehavior and corruption, protecting the lives of journalists, educating youth about media literacy and democracy questions, as well as trying to get people more engaged in, in uh, elections and democratic systems. So we are committed to this from various angles and have been for a long time, but lately, we have seen an increase in organizations working with and around social media platforms and applying for funding from us, both uh, originating in Sweden, but also internationally. So there are obviously, when we look at our applications, an increased concern about the question. And the rights of users, freedom of expression, legislative measures, um, inhibitions, restrictions, and as well as ownership of data. Uh, we as a funder are happy to respond to this and hence the project that we are currently funding uh, in partnering with Justitia on this. So we are very happy to invite you all here today to discuss the state of free speech in the digital age. 
So Postcode Stiftelsen, or the Postcode Foundation, is an international funder that we are based here in, in Sweden, in Stockholm. Uh, we, in our turn, receive all our funding from the Swedish Postcode Lottery, and it's thanks to the players of the lottery that we can make this possible and make this happen. Uh, our mission is to fund organizations both in Sweden and abroad, uh, and we have a firm belief that these organizations are vital in creating a better society. And that they are pro, uh, play an important role in creating a healthier, fairer and greener world. This vision we share with the Postcode Lottery Group. It's a social enterprise with lotteries in five different European countries uh, that exists solely for the purpose of raising both funds and awareness for good causes. In the fields of culture, nature, climate, health, togetherness, human rights, and peaceful and democratic societies. And we search for investment opportunities that match our expertise and that contribute to this mission. So, my first in-depth experience with, on, with hate online was in relation to cooking butter. Yeah, you heard it right, it was cooking butter. It was a bit bizarre. Uh, I wasn't the one who was the target of the hate and abuse. I was an observer as I had a period of my life where I was following threads and comments. I wanted to explore what people had to say about things. And this one was uh, a supermarket in Sweden that had put out the wrong price on cooking butter and people had purchased a lot. But the thread that developed from that, it was incredible, it was shocking. and. And this singular event was actually what opened my eyes to the amount of hate that can, that can occur um, on the internet. I think my naivety at that point was a faint memory, as was actually my willingness to engage personally in that kind of discourse. And I think this is where it becomes a danger as well, and why this project of free speech, both from a, from a legislative purpose, but also as an arena for free speech, why it becomes so important, because I don't think we can step back like I did. We need to be there continuously. So today's topic is so relevant, and this conference is well needed. We do need to find ways to move forward uh, into a future that is dignified for everyone, and where human rights and freedoms are being respected in all stages and all perspectives and all angles. So I'm thoroughly looking forward to today, to listen to the brilliant people that have been lined up uh, in the agenda. And uh, I want to thank Justitia and Vanderbilt University for the opportunity to be here today and to participate, uh, but also for running this project uh, uh, together with us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marie Dahlöv. And I think I'm not the only one who wants a link to the cooking butter incident online. Yes, our first speaker in this program is the much appreciated David Kay. I assume many of you are here to see him, as of our other speakers. He's nodding, no, no, he's not nodding. He's the professor of law at the University of California. And as Jacob mentioned, he is the former UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, to name a few of many engagements fitting for this day. 2019, his book was published, Speech Police, The Global Struggle to Govern the Internet. And we look forward to learning more on this in his presentation that is exciting already at its headline, Continuing Threats and Continuing Confusions over Freedom of Expression. And I remind you once again to store questions, because now we have uh, time for Q&As after our speakers. Okay? See you in a bit, and please welcome David Kay. Thank you for that. It's great to see everybody here. I especially want to thank uh, Jakob and Natalie for, for inviting me. I didn't ha actually have to come that far. I'm spending the year in Lund. So um, doesn't mean I can say a word in Swedish. So um, 
I apologize for that, but I really do want to express my thanks uh, to, to Justitia, in, in part because Natalie and Jakub are really um, not only organizing events like this, but they're also real scholars of, um, of import. Um, Jakob on free speech, and I hope you've read his book, The History of Free Speech, um, and Natalie on the history and, con and contemporary uh, threats of the far right. So I really encourage you to, um, to look at their scholarship in addition to, to the work here. Okay, so um, I want to start with an assertion, and then I'll end with a set of questions to which everyone, I think from governments to corporations to civil society, needs to have an answer. And the assertion is this. The internet is breaking free speech. The internet is breaking free speech. So what do I mean by this? After all, it's the internet that has expanded and democratized freedom of expression, access to information, like no technology in human history. I mean, really no question about that. It's the internet that gave us what we used to call netizens in China, or citizen journalists in North America or Europe or anywhere else, bloggers from Iran to Kenya to Cambodia. It's the internet that gives a teenager in Mumbai access to a library in Stockholm, right? Or a senior citizen with a tablet in Melbourne, access to government information in Indonesia, right? The internet has been an amazing force for access to information worldwide, and we could obviously go on with our examples. What's more, international human rights law, which sets the standards, as Jakob mentioned, essentially codifies freedom online as Article 19 of both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, both define it, freedom of expression means that everyone has the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, and through any media of one's choice. That's actually pretty much a quote from Article 19. I tell my students, you could either just commit that to memory or get a tattoo. It doesn't really matter to me, but it's something to keep in mind. And when you think about that codification in the digital age, think about the words that are used. Seek, search, right? Online search. Receive, download, impart, post any information or ideas across boundaries through any medium. We can celebrate this drafting foresight, you know, which was developed in an analog era for a digital age, just as we mark this month the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay, so that's all the good. But the internet, especially social media, search, and messaging apps, have also, in their own way, helped break a broad popular consensus around robust freedom of expression. And I say that for several reasons. First, the popular experience of social media and the mainstream media's description of that experience, which might heighten that experience, has facilitated a growing view of speech as harm. Right, speech as harm. And this isn't something that's just concocted by imaginary speech police officers worldwide. Whether it's harassment and misogyny, or Islamophobia and racism and anti-Semitism, or the widespread accessibility of white supremacist ideologies, or the disinformation and propaganda that course through online platforms every minute, the democratization of online speech or what Eugene Volokh once called cheap speech, has transformed what the average person sees and reads and hears. Speech as harm dampens enthusiasm for speech as democracy, for speech as human development, for speech as creativity. Speech as harm causes us to reframe what kind of restrictions we think are tolerable. Politicians, in turn, are both feeding 
and responding to the public perception of an internet gone bad, and speech as something to defend against. The very title of the UK's recently adopted <clears throat> regulatory framework, like Australia's, is the Online Safety Act, not the Online Freedom of Expression Act, the Online Safety Act, a model of prevention and mitigation of reaction to speech harms. The US Congress is considering a similarly entitled Kids Online Safety Act. Yet speech, as we know, and as Jacob, I think, ver put very succinctly, is much more than harm. It is, as the UN Human Rights Committee and regional courts have, uh, and domestic courts have noted for decades, a cornerstone of democratic society. It's a root of human communication, human development, and personality. But in the space of a decade or so, that view has come under attack, and we need to ask why. So that's the first internet breaking free speech, speech as harm. Second, corporate dominance of the internet has handed over the rulemaking for much of this situation to private actors. This is, from my perspective, principally, but not only a problem of social media, because it's also about gatekeepers and internet service provi providers, telecommunications companies, device manufacturers, app stores, they're gatekeepers and private gatekeepers everywhere now. And it's also not a problem of corporate actors in principle being able to moderate content within boundaries, of course, established by their human rights responsibilities to mitigate and prevent human rights harms. Instead, it's a problem of concentration, of so few actors having control over so much public speech. And the result of this concentration is that the public often sees speech rules governed not by the public interest, but by private interest of advertising, of uh, profit maximization. And um, of all governments, actually, and we saw a picture that Jacob gave us of Thierry Breton before, but of all governments, the EU, and we can debate the Digital Services Act and other things, the EU is farthest along on getting this kind of holistic understanding of the problem of private power over public speech. And hopefully during the day, we'll talk a little bit about that. Third, while there was once a belief in the untouchability of the internet, people will remember the Declaration of Independence of cyber, in cyberspace, the internet was originally perceived as a kind of realm beyond state jurisdiction, right? Governments uh, couldn't actually touch it. But of course, we know that's not the case, right? We've been sort of faced with the reality that governments have deployed the tools of the digital age, the tools of the internet, to crack down hard on individual privacy and the expression that privacy enables. It's, in some ways, really the gravest threat, the threat of state intervention. And we see that in the context of mass surveillance and targeted surveillance using tools like the NSO group's uh, Pegasus spyware. We see it in the ready ability of the state to interfere with the privacy of whistleblowers, journalists, and the sources that journalists have. We've seen it in the assault on digital security, essentially the foundation of the internet, encryption, and yet it is constantly under attack by law enforcement and intelligence agencies. And then, of course, in the very real shutdown sense, we see internet shutdowns. Even, again, as Jacob was mentioning before, this idea, and it was an idea that actually Emmanuel Macron mentioned last spring, that in the context of public protest, it might be necessary sometime to shut down websites or even shut down the internet. And then fourth and finally, the last that I'll mention in terms of the internet's um, approach to breaking free speech is automation and AI and essentially the coding of speech rules. Speech is harm has arrived with automation rules enforcing algorithmically right, the way in which we are allowed to speak, 
what we can post and so forth online. And that further distances individuals from the actual experience of engaging with a public authority to which it can appeal and discuss and learn why is it that particular speech may be considered beyond the pale. Okay, so as we consider these breakages, you don't have to agree with my idea that the internet is breaking free speech. Obviously, I'm using that in a way to frame the nature of the digital age. But I think we need to ask, what can we do to revive a broad commitment to freedom of expression? And for that, rather than offering specific answers, I'm just going to propose a few questions. And of course, I mean, I have the mic or this headset, which makes me feel a little bit like Taylor Swift or, or something. Um, but I want to start with a few questions and, and, and uh, some answers embedded in that. So first, I, I don't think it's enough simply to say free speech is being broken and, you know, that's a shame. I think it's incumbent on us to have an answer. Okay, if we don't like an online safety act, if we don't like the current approach of governments, what's our response to it? And so I think that our response to that needs to be embedded in international human rights law. The standards that are global, we'll talk, we're talking about a global industry, right? A global internet, which requires, I think, in many respects, uh, global solutions. And so I'll just mention a few things that I think would be important for us to think about as responses or alternatives to a current moment of speech as harm and regulation that flows from that. First, I would start with legislation that promotes online speech and in particular promotes privacy online as privacy is really a foundational element of freedom of speech online. I would call for narrow definitions in law of what those harms are so as to limit state discretion. Unfortunately, we often see laws that are simply too broad uh, it, um, and giving the state massive discretion to decide what to restrict and what not to. We need to perceive an ability to push back, right? We need to be able to appeal whether it's appealing state rules or corporate rules. We need to have that ability, and we often don't have that. And finally, we need competition policy. Again, an area where the European Union is moving ahead and the rest of the world can catch up. Second, we often talk about regulation and emphasis on the negative, right? What are the rules against speech harms? How do we avoid harm? So, I want to ask, is there a positive obligation for the state to take specific steps to promote freedom of expression? What would that look like? What, for example, would it look like for the state to promote diverse media and access to information? Are governments appropriately investing in the infrastructure necessary for robust freedom of expression? I think most of the arrows in the quiver, whatever the expression might be, tend to focus on the negative, not the positive. And third, and finally, do we have a game plan for how to protect freedom of expression in the coming wave of AI technologies? Do we just assume that our, our algorithmic future will be a speech protective one? There are technologies, and I think we'll learn about them, as to how AI can actually enhance freedom of expression, but is it only that? Are there red lines? that we ought to be drawing to ensure that AI does not supercharge the harm orientation we perceive today. So I'm gonna conclude now, which is good because I saw the note. I only had, maybe even I'm done with my time. I don't wanna leave the impression that I have all the answers. I gave more questions perhaps than answers. At the end of the day, I think we need to recommit to democratic models, not only in substance, that is the speech rules themselves, but also in our process for how we adopt them. And I'm going to close uh, actually with the words of David Bowie, um, who sang in 1972, Homo sapiens have outgrown their use. Extra points if you know what song that was from. All right? You'll, you can... Hmm? You'll, you'll, there's a little device that you might have discovered that allows you to find out the answer to, to that. 
Anyway, homo, homo sapiens have outgrown their use. As we enter into this intersection of an algorithmic future with free speech's future, it's that prediction, right, Bowie's prediction, that we ultimately have to disprove. So with that, thank you very much. I look forward to a, a full day of discussion with everybody. Thank you, David. And I would like to say if people watching online, you can write your uh, questions or write into this little square under the video. Self-explanatory, I would say, but you can write there. And uh, just before we uh, leave space for the next speaker, mm. I was uh, wondering about the corporate dominance you were talking about. What mm -hmm. would be an alternative to that? Well, the alternative is competition policy, is antitrust, and ensuring that you know, our speech rules are not dominated only by a small number of companies. This is actually particularly, I think, alienating outside the United States. Right? Most of the companies that we're talking about, the companies on top of the internet stack, mm -hmm. let's say, are American companies. And it's alienating. It's alienating because power is far from Europe, far from Asia, far from Africa. People don't necessarily have a sense that they are able to influence those rules, mm. rules that might not make sense in their own context. Right. So we need to be thinking about how to break that down. And if everyone, anyone has been to China and tried to use their firewall apps, I mean, some some companies are definitely owning the internet and the access. I don't think we have any questions from our friends online at this very moment, but I would also like to say that for next speakers, and the speakers in the room, you have questions too. Just hands up. Oh, we have one here. I thought that was also self-explanatory. You mm -hmm. can just raise your hand and ask whatever you want. Uh, old school. <laughs> right. Uh, um, thank you so much, David, uh, for a wonderful speech. And then... Um, like suggesting so solutions as well, um, and David Boy and then and Taylor Swift <laughs> vibes. Um, my name is Ayako, and I'm a DPhil uh, scholar at Oxford. Mm -hmm. And I have a question on the uh, recent Digital Service Act in Europe. So, like you know, you also like mentioned like all states, you know, have some like using the um, the internet, you know, like as a sort of tools, you know, to like crack down or like you know um, promote their own um, discretion of you know. Um, denouncing you know, free speech. Um, so do you think a digital service act you know, can be a sort of a trigger uh, to, uh, for the, you know, the positive you know, obligation of um, states to be cooperative with other stakeholders and to make you know, more sort of better direction for free speech? Yeah, that's a really great question. It's, you know, we're at this moment with the DSA where it's very early, we have this framework, but we don't have a whole lot of implementation. We have, again, to refer to uh, Jacob and, uh, and Thierry Breton, we have some worrying possibilities about how um, politicians and political actors will abuse the law in a way. Um, but I think actually the DSA in particular, its call for risk assessment, for public accountability, for transparency, that those, it's essentially an experiment, right? It's an experiment, and, and I would emphasize in particular researcher access. It's an experiment in the idea that more information will give government some tools to figure out how better to regulate digital space. And, but I emphasize experiment. I mean, we really don't know how that will turn out. It could be a huge expense that doesn't have a big payoff, or it could be if well-resourced and also well-articulated to the public, it could be a powerful tool for rethinking what are, the, what are the things we need to invest in in order to make the internet work more for freedom of expression, for individual you know, search, for all sorts of things. But I think, I mean, at the moment, the jury's out, but I, I'm more hopeful than, than not, but with a little bit of realism sprinkled in there. Maybe we have time for one more question, but uh, you learned your lesson. You just raise your hand and you ask your question to the speaker. So I think um, for this, we should be moving on. Also reminding people online. He, someone wants you to clarify actually how competition can be a solution to corporate dominance on internet that hinders free speech. Mm. 
Well, I mean, the, the main problem with concentration, the main problem with just a few private actors is that they're just not accountable, right? They're not account. I mean, the DSA is trying to change that, right? In, frankly, in modest ways, but they're not really accountable to the public interest. And so there, there are two different ways to, to deal with that. One is content regulation. And my concern with content regulation is that content regulation often gets to content overregulation, to taking down totally legitimate conversations, information, and so forth. But if we start to break down the size of companies, if we, and that doesn't necessarily mean breaking them down in the way that, you know, in the past, AT&T in the United States was broken down into individual pieces. It might mean separating out different parts of the platform so that, you know, one platform doesn't control, you know, billions of people's speech patterns basically on a day-to-day -day basis. It could also mean breaking them down globally, right? So that they're not as distant from the places where they have such an impact on public conversations. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's the idea behind uh, competition as an answer. Obviously, we could spend an entire course or an entire conference on competition policy, but I think it's one of those things that, that deserves more of our attention. Definitely. Very interesting. Thank you, we say, to David Kay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Thanks so much. for being a part of this day. And now we will focus on advocacy of hatred. And in this subject, we will talk to or listen to, at first, two representatives from the United Nations. And we will begin with Nazila Ghanea. She is not uh, here in this room with us, unfortunately. She will be with us on uh, video to start off this conversation. She is an international human rights lawyer and the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. So let's start things off with Nazila Ganeya. Dear colleagues and friends, it's a great honor to be able to offer some opening remarks for this conference. I very much regret that I'm not able to be with you in person, and I'm very thankful to the organizers for allowing me to share my thoughts with you via this video message. I also look forward to watching the conference online and hearing more about it from Daniel Cloney and Bethany Shiner, who are there with you in person. This conference is very timely, coming at a moment in which both freedom of expression and freedom of thought, conscience and religion or belief are facing new challenges in a context of great polarization and shocking conflict. It is a context in which these rights, which are in their nature indivisible and interdependent, are mistakenly framed by some as necessarily being in conflict with one another. Some assert the primacy of unrestricted freedom of expression in spite of the widespread advocacy of hatred based on religious or belief identity, which is increasingly visible and normalized in both online and offline spaces. Others insist that freedom of expression must be limited, such that offensive or shocking or from their perspective, blasphemous expressions be met with reprimand or criminalization. At best, these discourses represent a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of human rights, and at worst, a cynical manipulation of the hard-won fruits of 75 years of human rights activism for political ends. Like my predecessors, I reject this framing of a conflict of rights, and insist on their interdependence and indivisibility. Both rights and indeed other rights must be maximized to the highest attainable, highest achievable um, extent possible in every context. This is not to say that identifying the ways to maximize both rights is straightforward. Indeed, it has become more and more complex. With the ascent of the internet, there have been many positives for the global human rights movement and beyond, and for the lived experiences of human rights and transnational solidarity and community. The functioning of platforms through which people 
access and rely on the internet, however, is also contributing to polarization, facilitating the spread of manipulative and hateful expressions, forever morphing and taking new form, conspiracy theories, and incitement to violence. Purported attempts to regulate hate speech based on religion or belief in digital spaces are at times, unfortunately, a thinly veiled project to crack down on so-called blasphemy and to extend surveillance of religious or belief minorities, human rights defenders and others. This poses a serious challenge to the entire human rights project and addressing it effectively in a manner consistent with all human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities, will demand great creativity, multi-stakeholder engagement, and responsiveness. In this context, spaces such as this conference are of vital importance, and I'm grateful that this mandate is also represented. I wish all of you every success at this conference, and look forward to further collaboration with a view to seeking to collectively address these challenges. Thank you very much. So thank you to Nazila Ganea. Give her a hand, I think. And the same headline regarding free speech in regards to religion or belief and how to maximize both rights. We now present Daniel Cloney that is here with us for a presentation. He is the consultant at the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and he has some key recommendations about the challenges. And I'm just gonna see if I can help you with this issue, but I think not. If someone wants to step up that is administratively in charge. <laughs> okay, so I can just maybe do so you don't have to have this behind you, like this, you know? Yeah. Um, Watch that. I think Nazila's watching on With the internet. With those words, Daniel Cloney. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But, um, this is my first time with the Taylor Swift thing as well, so I'm still getting used to it. <laughs> it was my joke as well. I was thinking I was going to say something like that, and you said it. Um, so anyway, yeah, hi, my name is Daniel Cloney. I work with Nazila um, on her mandate at the United Nations, and I thought, well, you know, we thought that a 20-minute video would be a little bit too long. So I'm going to just expand a little bit on some of the points that she made and perhaps, um, first of all, introduce the right to freedom of religion or belief, because as she said, I think it's one of the more misunderstood human rights. Um, so speak about it in relationship to freedom of, uh, of expression and then talk about three challenges that from the perspective of Nazila's mandate, we've seen emerging and also from her predecessors um, over the last 10 years in relation to freedom of religion and belief and digital technologies. Yeah? So first of all, in terms of freedom of religion or belief as a human right, it's actually sometimes referred to as a neighboring right with freedom of expression. Both of them are Articles 18 and 19 in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the ICCPR. And uh, one of the former special rapporteurs, Heiner Bielefeld, he actually did great work um, elaborating some of the structural similarities that these two human rights have in, in human rights law. So. One very important uh, similarity they have is they both unconditionally protect what in sort of legalese we, took, we call the forum internum. No? So your internal uh, right to have or adopt a religion or belief, or in the Universal Declaration they talk about the, your right to change your freedom of religion or belief, which at the time was actually a very radical idea. Um, and that's a right which is unconditionally protected in international human rights law. And Article 18.2 of the ICCPR says that you, you can't be subjected to any coercion that might impair your ability to have or adopt or change your, freedom, your, your religion or belief. Um, in terms of the expressions, um, we speak about manifestations of religion or belief. The reason that we speak about manifestations is that they can go a little bit further than, say, a verbal expression or an artistic expression, but sometimes it's to do with, you know, living your life uh, in accordance with your beliefs. So things like dress codes, uh, things like conscientious objection to military service, um, things like um, dietary requirements, these were all fall underneath manifestations rather than expressions. But again, it's very similar to how freedom of, or freedom of expression is dealt with in terms of, say, the limitations criteria in international human rights law. Um, limitations to your religious or belief-based manifestations can only um, 
be uh, allowed if they are, you know, they're subject to the same principles of, of, of legality, pursuit of le legitimate ends, um, and necessity. Um, two more sort of just important notes on freedom of religion or belief. Um, it's important to emphasize, because sometimes it's framed this way, um, it, it doesn't protect religions or beliefs themselves. It protects human beings and their right to have or manifest those religions or beliefs. Uh, and a second thing that's important to know is that it's not particularly concerned with any religion or belief or set of religions or beliefs. It's not only concerned with theistic beliefs, it's also con concerned with non-theistic or atheistic beliefs. It also addresses, say, indigenous belief systems, um, which go far beyond what maybe in Europe we're, we're used to considering religions um, or beliefs. Um, freedom of religion or belief is obviously located within human rights treaties, yeah, the, the ICCPR specifically, but also in the, in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And in that regard, it has to be understood in light of all those other rights. So freedom of religion or belief is also, and this is a common misunderstanding, it's not there to be a bulwark against progress in terms of, say, non-discrimination um, or gender justice. Um, or, to, or to sort of justify any human rights violations. It's sometimes, I think, framed that way. I think sometimes there's a strategic discourse uh, to propose it, uh, th that understanding of it, but actually to really realize uh, freedom of religion or belief, you have to realize the other human rights as well, obviously including freedom of expression. So with that in mind, um, I just want to highlight three things uh, that we've seen from the perspective of the mandate. You may not know how uh, special rapporteur mandates work exactly, but we um, one of the mechanisms that Nazila has at her disposal is to communicate with governments directly about situations of concern, just raise concern, ask questions um, about situations that, say, civil society organizations have, uh, have drawn our attention to. And I'll just draw on a few of them from the last year to highlight what we are seeing um, in terms of digital technology and its proliferation and how that impacts freedom of religion or belief. So um, the first thing I would say is surveillance, and David has obviously done a huge amount of work on that, which as a digital rights activist at the time was really groundbreaking. We were very happy to see that, um, see surveillance make its way into the, the discourse of, of the UN. Um, so surveillance in terms of religion or belief, uh, a couple, you know, Ahmed Shahid, the, pri the, the prior special rapporteur, spoke about this at length um, in terms of counter-terrorism uh, and counter-terrorist um, programs and their use of uh, digital technologies that purport to be able to infer uh, extremist thought, which is very nebulous and very dangerous, right? So one of the key ways in which religions or uh, 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 religious minorities and, and communities uh, are sort of demonized is this extremist idea, right? So um, in certain countries now, they're starting to combine things like digital footprints and so on uh, in order to uh, purport, uh, purportedly infer that people, um, that, 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 that people might be extremists and uh, then facilitate their criminalization. The second thing uh, is in terms of blasphemy laws making their way into the digital space. Um, so we had two cases in the last year um, where Obviously, blasphemy laws, uh, you know, and this, is, this goes way back in the, in the um, canon of, of freedom of religion or belief, are, are, are not, they're sometimes promoted as being uh, there to protect religion or belief, or freedom of religion or belief, but actually they have the opposite effect. And in the digital space, we've seen um, people um, being arrested uh, over the last year. One case in uh, Nigeria, which was actually just a case where somebody had denounced violence in the name of religion or belief that had taken, case, that had taken place and then was, was arrested for blasphemy. Um, in another case, we had, uh, which one was it? Uh, yes, in Pakistan, then um, the Ahmadiyya community, just because people had been sharing an Ahmadi holy book on WhatsApp, they were arrested and charged with blasphemy. Um, then the third challenge, of course, is incitement uh, to violence and advocacy of hatred on the basis of religion or belief. This is obviously spreading very quickly through social media. Uh, a lot of the time, this is quite related also to accusations of blasphemy in many cases. And um, 
And it's built on a bedrock of, of a broader kind of demonization and this kind of everyday expression of disdain based on religion or belief for certain communities, is often quite gendered and often quite racialized as well. Uh, and it's very important to take an intersectional perspective on this. Um, how to grapple with this? I mean, as Nazila said, we, we need creativity, we need coordination, it needs to be a multi-sectoral approach and spaces like this are very, very important. One thing that we do have clarity on, I think, from our side is that the answer cannot be to lower the bar for what's considered, uh, you know, to, uh, incitement that should be criminalized. If we keep lowering that bar, we'll actually do harm to freedom of religion or belief. Actual freedom of religion or belief also means creating space for dissident tendencies within religious communities. It means creating space for minorities who might be deeply stigmatized. And the experience is that when that bar is lowered, it's inevitably used against uh, exactly those groups. Um, so counter speech obviously has a vital role to play. And I'm going to be very interested uh, to listen to the other uh, interventions on, 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 the, on the question of counter speech over the course of the day, uh, especially because we're currently developing a report uh, for the Human Rights Council, which is going to be presented in March, but it's due, at the end of, due to be finished at the end of this month on advocacy of hatred and how it can be addressed. Um, but finally, I suppose it's worth just considering what can be done beyond uh, this sort of dichotomy that's presented, um, criminalization or counter speech. Um, I read a very good response to Jeremy Waldron, some people will be familiar with his work on free speech, um, saying that the, the harm to the dignity of, say, religious or belief minorities in society is not the speech itself, though that has its impact, it's the existence of hatred. It's the existence of hate, hateful attitudes towards those groups within society. And how, how are those um, attitudes generated? To be sure, it has something to do with speech, but it has structural roots, yeah? Um, it has structural roots. It's often to do with the legal system. It's often to do with the constitution. It's often got a huge amount to do with education. And um, so what, what role can, you know, a, could, could a transformative approach play? Um, w w what if we looked beyond this debate? And what, again, as actors in the room, in the private sector, in social media and so on, if we look beyond things like counter speech, what else could be done in order to disincentivize uh, the spread of those hateful attitudes um, and their manifestations, which are, which are their inevitable uh, result? So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm very happy to answer. Thank you, Daniel Tony. And as you said, uh, questions are very welcome. We have our two assistants here with microphones. So just hand up if you have a question for Daniel at this moment. Otherwise, I'll get started for you. Jacob is ready in the back if he can be reached by a microphone. You sure you don't want a coffee instead? <laughs> <laughs> you may have an idea as to what I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be asking about. Uh, uh, um, so, so this... Um, the Danish government's um, uh, bill on, on reintroducing at least a, a certain form of blasphemy, is that something that gives rise to concern uh, from, um, from the mandate holder? Um, uh, and, and, and what would be the proper uh, response uh, to this? I, I can only speak for myself now because Nazila is not here. I mean, we haven't actually seen in great detail what you know, an English translation of it, so it's quite, it's quite difficult to say. I'll send it to you. <laughs> Thank the you. The Danish uh, language is a barrier for everyone, I can yeah, say. Yeah, I mean, um, I suppose uh, it's, it's like you said at the beginning, right? We have to analyze it in light of the standards that have been, uh, that have been uh, developed already. And a huge amount of work has gone in over the last, as you'll be aware, over the last 15 years to develop... Um, um, or to break through this kind of uh, this kind of dichotomy about what what should be considered advocacy or just fine, and we have the Rabat Plan of Action from 2012, which has you know six aspects that need to be looked into um, of any particular expression that could uh, uh, you know represent incitement in order to identify it. So I suppose it really needs to be judged in light of those standards. And you know, prima facie, it seems like it's a bit more blanket than that, isn't it? It's just kind of saying if you do this, then it's then it's criminalized. Yeah. Um, so again, with a f knowing that much about it, it's it's enough to say that it's suspect uh, from the position of freedom of religion or belief. Um, I don't think I could really say more than that, um, but uh, yeah, I'm sure it's one of those debates that's really not going to go away and probably, you know, 
in six months we'll still be we'll still be talking about it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah not at all. Thank you. But I also have some questions and I uh, encourage you in the room and online to ask questions to Daniel. I'm wondering when you say we're not supposed we, we can't lower the bar for what is uh, incitement. Incitement mm. of violence or hatred. Mm. Yeah. So what are some legal limits to that? What is the landscape surrounding that issue? How, how is that um, a problem? Yeah, I mean, the, the standard as far as um, Article 20, Paragraph 2 uh, of the ICCPR is that it has to be advocacy of, hatred con or advocacy of hatred constituting incitement to discrimination or violence, right? And it's very difficult to prove that, right? So, so again, if you just have a ban, then there's a lot of speech that could obviously be quite legitimate and necessary as an exercise of, uh, exercise of freedom of religion or belief that would find itself criminalized, yeah, uh, potentially. Um, so the standard really should be quite high because otherwise, what, well, I mean, the, the fact is a lot of hate speech laws have spread in lieu of, um, of blasphemy laws over the last few years. So, I mean, there was a reduction in blasphemy laws. A lot of hate speech laws came up that, again, use this language of incitement sometimes. But um, the actual use, especially in situations where you do have religious minorities who have a history of being uh, structurally marginalized, it's actually used to, to continue criminalizing them. So unfortunately, you have to keep the bar very high, even if it means you have to listen to really unpleasant stuff. Um, because otherwise, um, generally, criminal justice especially is going to be utilized against groups who are already marginalized and stigmatized. And I also want to ask about, obviously, the Koran burning, since we're here in Stockholm. Mm. Uh, did you monitor that? What was your impression of that? And um, what yeah, are so your general views on where we're talking about maximizing rights, where rights of uh, belief, religion meets rights of expression? Yeah, so that was obviously a massive issue of concern when it happened. Um, and there was an urgent debate at the UN Human Rights Council in the summer as a result, and a resolution came out of it, Resolution 53-1, which on the basis of which actually we, we decided to write a report now for, for the Human Rights Council on mm -hmm. this issue. Um, and there's also all kinds of follow-up happening within the UN um, about it. Honestly, one thing is that we're trying to reiterate that what we're talking about mostly is a freedom of expression issue. Um, freedom of It's talked about in terms of freedom of religion or belief, but in a sense, it's, if anything, it's about discrimination on the basis of religion or belief. If it does, if it does constitute incitement, then it's more that. It's not really reaching the level of coercion in general, right? Um, although I suppose you could imagine that happening. Um, so it's something that we're constantly in contact with certain states, like the Organization of uh, Islamic Co Cooperation, are also you know, following up on, um, on this resolution a lot. Um, but we haven't, had any, we haven't made any communications directly about it. And obviously, mm -hmm. a special rapporteur came to Sweden um, in, in October and realized an entire you know, two weeks here of meetings with civil society, mm -hmm. with religious uh, or belief communities, with um, obviously the government in order to sort of see how they're addressing it and will publish a report in March, again, to yeah. the government of Sweden I will with recommendations on it. I will it. pressure you even more. Like mm -hmm. asking a UN person to summarize is a bit tricky, I realize. But uh, we're also in a situation where Sweden is being pressurized by Turkey, Erdogan. You may all know this. Um, that we are uh, being called Islamophobic as a nation and certain parties even more. And some parties are even using this to get like a political advantage. So we're in this position in Sweden right now. Yeah. But uh, where, where, where do you consider that to be? Like that political mobilization from both sides mm. is quite interesting. Both Erdogan and Swedish... Sweden Democrats yeah. that are using this yeah. as a way to get more more uh, advantage. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know enough about Sweden to, to, I think to, to speak do. in detail, but uh, what I would say is that's the perspective on human rights law that's very valid, is, that, is to look at how do states talk about human rights and which human rights do states talk about and what might actually underlie, what might actually be their motivation, um, you know, in that regard. And I think that is, um, there's a whole school of thought that really just wants to analyze human rights in those terms. It's like, who talks about it and why? And then what human rights do they not talk about? And why do they not consider that important? And they do consider this important. So 
I think so you, what you're saying is that Erdogan may not feel that all human rights are important, but when used in a political context for other nations, very important. Is that how I can translate you could say that and, UN language to regular language? And uh, you could say that, and you could also ask the same of Sweden, if you were being provocative. Let's do that. Yeah. Let's be provocative. We're just getting started. <laughs> and about that, first of all, thank you, Daniel Cloney, for being here. My very pleasure. interesting. And thank you to Nazila Ganea as well. Very insightful. And now... I will let you guys take a coffee break. I will allow you. And we will reconvene a bit later than 11, I would say. Maybe 11.10. So everyone gets the time to do your, your needs. Okay? See you soon. Thank you. You're all very welcome to take your coffee and fika with you to be seated. And you can enjoy our next speaker that is a Swedish native for today. Very uh, loyal, all of you sitting down. Thank you. And also hello to our friends watching online. Uh, we have, I think, hopefully more questions coming up. We have a few panels in the afternoon as well. And um, our mic, mic responsible people here with us today are gonna be uh, visible for you. So you can just take any of them when it's your time. Thank you, sir. Now, we are ready. We continue this day's program with the presentation, Sharing Hope and Activating Allies. And with a very interesting initiative, I am here, journalisten Mina Dennert. She mobilizes allies to counter conspiracy theories, hate speech. Very interesting. And I th think that maybe the technology is with us as well. Before I present our next speaker, it is not. So I will just continue to speak a bit about, you can ask questions afterwards to Mina Dennert about the importance of value-based communication, partnerships, activating allies, and building strong communities as a way of actually countering the very strong efforts to undermine free speech. Do you want to come up here? Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be afraid of the spotlight. Never is good. And after that, we will talk to Carmen Lau, here with us from Hong Kong. And after that, we will have a session with Faisal al Mutar from Ideas Beyond Borders before going to lunch and then going into panel sessions. <laughs> I'm just sneaking up on you now. Is Sorry. it really working? Yeah, I, I can't think, believe this. I think, what I a think cliffhanger. <laughs> the founder of I Am Here International, Mina Dennett. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me once again to this conference. Really enjoying the day and all the fantastic presentations we've seen already. Um, so when I first saw this post, it was a couple of years ago, I started laughing because it claimed to be investigative journalism. And so as an investigative journalist myself, I started to ser searching for the actual disclosure. And um, But this was it. This was the... Um, mapping, as they called it. So they, what they had basically done was to take screenshots from our Facebook <laughs> accounts and called us Hate Terror Network. Um, so I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. Uh, I don't need to, you know, mind them uh, or think about this anymore. But the next day, another post was published, just like this one, they called us terrorists. And then the next day, and then the next day. And each time um, someone was posting uh, something like this, and I think it added, like, at the most it was like 10 or 15 people who were kind of eager to, <laughs> to, to call us hate terrorists. You know, I wasn't <laughs> able to, to get funding for, for the work or find partners here. So these... Uh, You've seen this. I mean, there are num numerous attacks like these all the time. And I wanted to 
to share this one, especially it's it's a few years ago now, but uh, it's really describes really well the imbalance of these attacks. So the Swedish Church and um, uh, the then Archbishop uh, Antje Jekyllén, I think they had uh, they have like six million members, and yet she was she announced that she had to leave uh, then Twitter now X because of the threats and the lies being spread on her account. And this was just months before the big uh, la latest church election. So this was no uh, coincidence. This was really planned. Um, so the, an organizer can have, or an organization can have like six million followers or members, but if they only have one or a few accounts to, um, to communicate from, to spread their information, the balance is hopeless in a, in a situation like this. So if a targeted person or an organization fails to kind of defend themselves by blocking the attacks or by sending out other messages, um, they get marginalized or made completely silent. So, and you can also see like, um, a lot of it, it's, it's the same kind of rhetoric with terrorism, Muslim, Islam, very like, focused on that, even when they attack someone uh, from the Swedish church. And so this is like a, I think, I mean, I, I don't have numbers, but it's, these are the kind of attacks that we have mostly in Sweden is uh, targeting Muslims. And uh, here they say, why do, why do you have two people with uh, uh, hijabs? Uh, they call them Hamas help. <laughs> so this is from a recent example, uh, an organ help organization. Uh, wearing um, Muslim attributes or other um, <laughs> like expressions uh, are never seen in public unless they are in um, it, unless it's in a negative context. So how can we make uh, our own voices heard on social media? This is what like huge interest. <laughs> and um, con when we're constantly drawn into this um, narrative, so how can we communicate what we believe in: equality, human rights, freedom of speech, uh, more effectively? And what does research say about how to use language to influence people's attitudes? So this is something I'm really interested in and kind of dig into. So uh, this is what I found. To be able to reach people, we need to understand people's underlying values. So um, this is what like, um, those who drive hateful messages do all the time. They... Um, uh, spread the use of fear and lies and conspiracy theories uh, to influence people to build support for the, the injustice and uh, misogyny and the racism. And that's kind of exactly what we need to do. But of course, <laughs> in um, using value-based communication to build the issues, you know, commu to communicate the issues that we work for and that we believe in. And so uh, I kind of looked at what motivates people and to under, uh, kind of understand like how can you reach people. And so this is the Schwartz uh, model of uh, human values. So our values obviously is what, you know, um, where we get our attitudes, our opinions, uh, and it influences like how we see the world. And they also color uh, uh, the way that we interpret cold facts. So that's kind of interesting as well. So um, looking at this model, it's kind of easy to understand both ourselves and also other people, the people that we're speaking to, and also understand why sometimes it feels like we don't speak the same language as <laughs> some of the people that we talk to. Um, and it's also easy to see how some of the messages that we might be spreading is triggering even to people with val values on a, maybe another part of the scale. And so if I say, for example, that we women should have uh, more, have increased influence over decisions and uh, processes, or that we should have a work, multicultural workspace, or we, why don't we all go to the Pride Festival? It doesn't seem positive. It doesn't sound positive to everyone, uh, depending on what values they have. So once we understand how diametrically different some of us tell right from wrong, or um, 
like how we see the world. We need to learn the most important lessons when it comes to uh, like changing people's attitudes. And what we need to remember is that we uh, know that people, if they get a lot of positive messages, uh, um, activating positive feelings regarding the issues that we want to communicate, like freedom of speech or anti-racism or uh, democracy, they will swing to our side. But on the other hand, if they're constantly under the influence of like, listening to the messages uh, that are negative and with, driven by fear, they're more inclined to kind of get those attitudes. So uh, to put it kind of simple, the one with the most posts and the most reactions uh, will win this, like whatever battle or what we call it. So with all these challenges in mind and possible solutions in mind, uh, nearly eight years ago now, like even before, this is so, <laughs> so long on social media, it's like before Brexit, it's before the Trump election, it's before, I don't think anyone had ever heard about fake news or, I didn't know what algorithms was. <laughs> so it's back in 2016 that, uh, that I saw consequences uh, online from uh, journalists and uh, politicians, especially if they were women or especially if they were uh, people of color that were attacked. Uh, and I became, became interested in what was going on and I started kind of uh, seeing that people that I was uh, friends with on social media started to get re really radicalized and started sharing stuff uh, that was, to me as a journalist, was obvious misinformation. But um, I kind of understood really soon that they didn't realize that what they were spreading wasn't true. So I thought, okay, so maybe I can uh, make a difference or like share what I know from how media and <laughs> journalism works. So I um, developed a method to kind of lessen the fear of um, commitment for others that uh, are seeing things and reading them and kind of have opinions, but don't uh, have, like feel fear of, of expressing them. Uh, so uh, we kind of made, made a, I made a, started an initiative to kind of going to the comment sections together, counter speaking and doing it in a constructive and non-confrontal way to help stop polarization. So the counter speaking that was going on was really kind of hateful at that time. <laughs> so you couldn't really tell like who's the good guy in this <laughs> discussion because everyone's really, you know, just attacking each other. So the big difference that we kind of made was that we, uh, it was going to be easy to see like who was factual and who was um, benevolent or and now uh, we're active in 18 countries worldwide. So the, the fact that I couldn't work in Sweden actually made me go uh, international instead. And uh, we're, the network is now 150,000 members strong. And so, uh, <laughs> thanks. So we're working every day to stop the politically uh, motivated hate and help people dare engage in the debate and turn social media more trustworthy. So, and we're also uh, educating thousands of people, organizations um, and uh, schools and um, uh, politicians, journalists, influencers, uh, to use their community to neutralize destructive and um, uh, work, like use their platforms for good. So this is how it works. Any member can um, suggest where the network is needed. So like in Sweden, I think we're like, 70,000 members, so anyone can suggest, okay, when anyone encounters hate speech, they send a link to the moderators. We make sure that it's actually a hate speech in that comment section, so it's not just two neighbors <laughs> growling, fighting about something, but you know, that it's really um, uh, like uh, attacks. Um, and we write a very neutral post on what's happening and uh, reminding everyone to like, when they go uh, high, if we, when they go low, we go high. And then um, we write standalone comments. So um, we don't answer the hateful messages. And so then we can also like kind of like each other's comments up. And uh, it, it doesn't necessarily work in all the algorithms anymore, but uh, until very recently, if... Uh, 
you had the the comment with the <laughs> most likes. It was the most. It was well, we made them top level comments. Uh, and the research from the Dusseldorf Institute for Internet and Democracy showed that this method really works. That uh, people who were not members of the, uh, commu uh, the um, community or the networks started to follow our lead in writing constructive messages as well when, they, when we interacted like this. And they started using arguments. And so um, I wanted to share a little bit like how we, <laughs> because there's a lot of people like active in this whole area of, you know, in the online debate. And so they're a little bit different on like what, um, like how they operate and what motivates them. So we also kind of meet them in a little bit different way. And uh, some of them are highly organized and very professional, so to, <laughs> to speak, uh, but most of course, are just you know regular pe people uh, uh, who don't don't necessarily understand that they're part of someone else's political or, or economical campaign. So we're working a little bit different with them, depending on like who we kind of just like from exchanging a couple of you know sentences back and forth. You can kind of tell where <laughs> where they are, where they are. So it's really like from the silent. A frustrated reader that might be you know, motivated by curiosity or fear or anger, then it's like we kind of respond low effectively and uh, discuss nuanced. While the tro uh, trolls and info warriors, you might want to ignore those and just uh, focus on your uh, own uh, messages. While the extremists and you know um, that are motivated by intimidation and destruction, just like really remove all that kind of. Um, uh, uh, all that kind of content from the platforms. And so when we uh, counter speak, we do it for the readers. So we um, really kind of really want to um, encourage and uh, motivate the allies and kind of engaging them in, in um, going on. And uh, we also have proof of that we, that is actually working that, uh, I just wanted to quote <laughs> the editor-in-chief here when she thanks the group for supporting uh, them after a um, massive attack on, the, on their uh, news outlet. And she says making, um, that we're, our support is making a huge difference that helps us endure this shitstorm <laughs> that is, uh, uh, splashes over us now. So by uh, supporting all these actors, we kind of support uh, the freedom of speech and ensuring that you know um, everyone can really receive information that is not mani manipulated or serving a particular person, entity, or interest. Thank you. We say thank you to Mina and my colleagues with the microphones. We'll be parading up and down, we awaiting your questions on counter speech in this method presented by Mina Dennett. And awaiting your questions, and maybe from the chat, if Nick keeps an eye on that. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this fear of commitment or fear of expressing an opinion that, that they don't share with these people. You call them hate mobilizations or such. What do you think that is um, dependent on? If there's any actions to be made about that fear? Uh, I think they're seeing what other people are um, being, like how they treat other people. And that's also what people told me, why they couldn't engage, why didn't, they didn't you know, dare mm -hmm. to fund us. or Because I, I remember people saying, oh, I'm the only one with my, last, with my surname in my family and they're going to target me. Or So they see what happens to others and they mm -hmm. kind of... Uh, really uh, on a daily basis that mm -hmm. people are getting these uh, um, pylons and mm -hmm. attacks. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, that's really scaring, I think, for most of us. Yes, definitely. And uh, that's something I think David Kay was in on, that uh, hate speech dampens other free speech, democratic free speech. And now we have a question from Clara from Örebro University, as yes. I remember. Yes, oh, you remember, thank you. Uh, I'm a rhetorician from uh, Örebro University. Uh, I have a question about the slide you were showing with the... Um, with the different like players <laughs> and the, you had like a table for the different counter strategies. Are those like advices or are those like proven to work? No, um, these are developed by us, like how we, how we operate. So I, I don't have research to prove that, you know, so this is like experience. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, because I was going to ask some similar questions, but I want to, I want to um, focus this on the platforms a bit because these are very good initiatives by individuals, private individuals. But uh, how have you been targeting the platforms and the fact that they promote content that is hateful in itself? So this is something that we've been working with, you know, especially Mita, for many years, and. Um, but unfortunately, I'm not sure, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to say that there's still a lot of work needed to be done. Have you been in contact with different platforms? Yes. How do they answer to these mm, oh, issues? It's, um, <laughs> it's a long discussion that we've had, you know, with them for, for many years. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, did you want to? No, but you can, you can, we have time, you can answer, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. oh, thank you so much. And actually, my question is related to the discussion like, and we just had. Um, so Ayako again from Oxford. Um, the, so again, I understand that your sort of like major um, um, work is uh, about counter, you know, counter speech, you know, counter hate speech or like something. But and also like, you know, um, on extremists, and you said you report it to the um, platform companies or I'm just curious because you worked a lot in you know, a with Meta. Uh, maybe you're also in contact with uh, Oversight Board, and then um, I, you know, in terms of the uh, regard, regarding the the research of the languages, you know, like uh, they moderate content. It's like ninety more than ninety percent English. So, and um, because you worked in many other countries, in like non English, you know, um, the native countries, and then. Um, I'm just curious, you know, how you see the sort of like um, disparities, you know, in dealing with different languages in hate speech, especially like online content moderation or reportings um, or response to that. I'm sorry. What, what was the actual question? Oh, the question is like, you know, like maybe like you know, if you are in contact with like Meta, it's like a kind of or oversight board, mm -hmm. you know, which is you know uh, in charge of the content moderation um, globally, uh, but you know they don't really like deal with you know non English content mm. in there. Is you know. there a difference between the the languages used on their platforms? Exactly, because you know okay. you like show a lot of you know like a different languages, especially you know like mm. in Swedish or like in any other you know Nordic languages. Of course, and hate speech is everywhere. Mm. So I'm just curious, you know, like um, about your experience on, on mm. you know, uh, in communication with those sort of global um, oversight board mm. um, to deal with different sort of contexts in um, of so language and beyond. You mean uh, national and cultural differences in in dealing with the oversight boards of Meta? Oh yeah, like you know. The that vice versa, actually, like, you know, meta, you know, deal, you know, like national or like, you know, context, mm. you know, local context as well. But, you know, like, you know, from my perspective, maybe they're not, they don't have a, you know, like good capacity mm. to, you know, deal with like a different sort of, especially non-English. You know. It's also a great initiative, a great organization. I mean, I think it's really needed. Uh, and especially this kind of education in how to communicate with people with different opinions uh, online. But in my research, I have, um, I have also done research on language use in this kind of conflict between journalists and people who are, you know, opposed uh, traditional media in Sweden. Through the national security law, which you may have heard of, it's a very specific example of a very global threat. So please welcome Carmen Lau. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just arrived Stockholm last night and it's minus 11 degree, which is really different from where I came from because our winter is usually 11 degrees. So um, 
Yeah, I fled to London two years ago, but then um, I fled because uh, of the fear of political persecution and also um, the Hong Kong government's undermining different kind of freedom and our rights. But then I found that even though I flee Hong Kong, even though I now live in a so-called free countries, the fear and the repression didn't stop. So um, I'm not really academic, so I just today I just wanted to share my personal experience as an individual, as a Hong Konger. Um, in 2019, we had a really massive uh, democratic uh, movement in Hong Kong, which is called anti-extradition movements. Many of you may have heard about it. Um, we have two million Hong Kongers went on the street to protest against the anti-extradition uh, anti bill and also um, China's repression on Hong Kong and the crackdown of high autonomy in Hong Kong. Um, during 2019, there were there was a district council elections, and I was 24. And thanks to all the pro-democratic supporters, I won in the election along with uh, eight uh, three thousand sorry 388 pro-democratic politicians. But by then. Uh, it wasn't a new thing for the Hong Kong or the Chinese proxies to uh, do those kind of smearing campaigns to intimidate politicians or activists. I myself has been actually one of the victim of um, this kind of smearing campaign during my elections campaign. Um, I was called, I was portrayed as a prostitute, um, which is really common among like um, Hong Kong female politicians to be portrayed as this way. And unfortunately, I was one of those victims. And, but that didn't stop because we did actually won the seat in, um, in the district council. And um, therefore, as the protest didn't stop, even though the government was trying to use pandemic uh, regulations to stop people from gathering on the streets. So in 2020, there's an implementation of national security law. And um, a lot of my friends and colleagues are now in jail. They are now either in jail or in exile because of the national security law. And it can be seen as a recognized arbitrary law to um, post crackdowns and declines on the different kinds of rights, especially um, rights to uh, protest, rights to uh, assemblies, and also especially freedom of speech. And since 2020, there are now 19 media organizations in Hong Kong has been forced to dismantle. 27 themes were censored. Thousands of books are removed from public library just because they may endanger national security law. One actually was written by a pro-democratic politician, but it was about food and cuisines in Hong Kong. So it's entirely a political book also being censored. And as of, sorry, as of the 2nd of December, the days here, we have now 1,741 political prisoners now in jail in Hong Kong. And not only the national security law, but also the Hong Kong government have been using sedition law to, to associate or to, to actually simply express your opinion. So we have now diasporic civil society and a lot of events and to uh, discuss about the patriotic reform of the Legislative Council elections and also the District Council elections. And because of this, I was wanted by the Hong Kong government over blind vote incitement. Not to mention that this charge is ridiculous because people have their rights to protest during elections. But then, um, for a speech happened overseas, are being wanted by the Hong Kong authorities is also strange to me because it never happens to me on the free soil I got um, being wanted by an authoritarian government, which I, which that space that I could never, may never go back.
this kind of extra dish extraterritorial law enforcement didn't only happen to activists or uh, advocates, but also ordinary Hong Konger. A um, Japanese student, she actually holds a Japan Japanese passport, um, has been arrested in uh, the Hong Kong at the Hong Kong airport because of her speech uh, made when there was when the time during she was in Japan. And she was now jailed for two months under sedition. And uh, these kind of um, online speeches, um, is a prominent uh, labor rights activist, and he's been in the Hong Kong Civil Society for so many years. Um, he, um, the reason of this arrest warrants uh, issued on him was because a speech he was made in a labor conference in Paris, which also not um, any of um, his uh, actions or his behavior done in Hong Kong. And 48 of their relatives and um, associates were inside Hong Kong were being arrested or interrogated as well. And this creates a sense of fear to um, not only Hong Kong or inside Hong Kong, but also our diaspora community, because uh, many of them still have their relatives and uh, friends inside Hong Kong, and even like ordinary community member, even if they are not really outspoken or they don't have the public face, they are still being really aware to participate in any kinds of, you know, rallies, protests, or even conference like this. People cannot like being live streamed or being photo taken in, in these kind of um, um, occasions where they may speak about Hong Kong. And the threats. Um, I just two weeks ago, I I was in San Francisco with Anna. Uh, we host we co-host a um, protest against uh, Xi Jinping during the APEC summit, and because she is a wanted person with bounties on her head, uh, when she announced she would travel to San Francisco, she got death threats, not only online but also through emails and these sort of um, media methods where. Um, actually did harm our advocacy work. And um, people not only uh, threatening her by saying, um, like, just ordinary threats. It seems strange to say that, but some, somehow there's intimidation or harassment or threats that we, we, we see is as less threatening. But then drops, drop her unconscious body at the Chinese consulate is really, you know, create a sense of fear among us. I'm still processing this kind of traumatized emotion right now because um, it's, you know, it's personal. And then not only digital threats, but during the protest, I got physically assaulted along with all the other protesters. My, both of my our opinion will be seen as kind of fake or make up uh, opinions. Our calls are not as um, solid after being this kind of uh, uh, receiving this kind of disinformation attacks. And not to be surprised, I got my um, my WhatsApp, my Telegram and even Signal account were being attempted to hacked. And it happens to many Hong Kong activists as well. Um, we found this kind of a systematic uh, attacks and um, it happens not only once or twice occasionally, but it often happens after some kind of opinion or some kind of actions you, you have made. For example, maybe a speech in parliament or host uh, or held a protest, attend a protest. And to the Hong Kong government's national security law isn't an end to impose repression to Hong Kong people inside Hong Kong and the diaspora. But it has just announced that um, the Article 23, which is actually a additional provision um, to the Hong Kong Basic Law, is going to uh, be enacted this year or next year. Um, 
the uh, Article 23 was originally a law that's um, imposed by the uh, C, uh, by the NPC. It's great to be here. Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, I think I'm the only speaker standing between you and lunch, so I'm, I'm going to try to be very brief because I know some people might be hungry right now. So uh, thank you, Jacob, and the future for, for free speech. Um, and I'm going to give you kind of brief about myself. I'm, my name is Faisal. I'm originally from Iraq. I was born in Babylon, a place you might be familiar with, the one that's mentioned in the Bible, the, the actual Babylon. Um, and then I grew up in Baghdad. So my first kind of experience with censorship was growing up under the regime of Saddam Hussein. And my first conversation with my dad when we were standing up at two in the morning, uh, listening to radio that used to be broadcasted to us from the neighboring countries. And the, the reason why it was at night is because the government censors a lot of the radio signals during the, the morning and the fact that we can hide. And therefore, if our neighbors cannot catch us, if they would cut us, they would be being in prison. Uh, the same punishment that was applied to anybody who owns satellite television and any way for you to be connected to the internet and be to the outside world. So that's my first kind of experience with censorship. The other one was, is kind of what I would call the Iraqi version of, of sex talk, in which my, my parents said that anything that is discussed in the house cannot go outside the house, because otherwise, if we were saying anything that was critical of the regime inside the house, and then if only of our neighbors or even some of my school, my school colleagues would know, um, because there was a statistic that kind of was the belief for, let's call it the trend at the time, was out of four adults, one is in the intelligence services. So there were even sources that people were actually divorcing and going through divorce because they thought that their partner was part of the intelligence services. So that's how deep what I would call like neuro-authoritarianism in which actually they get into your head in which you become afraid of your own best friend or sometimes your own, your own husband and, and wife. So you probably have heard of something called the Iraq War. It happened in 2003, and then Saddam Hussein, that kind of uh, authoritarian regime, was removed, uh, and we start having the internet. So, so as a result of the 2003 war, uh, finally Iraq started having an internet. And so here's what, what I think what, what happened, is that we moved kind of from 1984, and kind of a version of the Middle East, um, and into brave new world. So we moved from kind of centralized authoritarianism into kind of decentralized kind of form of information in which like every militia, every political party, uh, et cetera, start having its own kind of propaganda newspaper, propaganda channel, and trying to utilize information as a way to stir up the civil war, which eventually happened a uh, couple years after the 2005. So you can live, I grew up in West Baghdad, which, which eventually became uh, known as, as a kind of where most of the U.S. Army was killed. But it, it, so you go from West Baghdad to another neighborhood and also West Baghdad, and they listen to different sources of information, and they can have a completely different version of reality. So you, there could be like a, a suicide attack happening in a supermarket, and you can talk to two people in two different neighborhoods, and they tell you a completely different story of how it happened and why the person, and who, which, which group is actually responsible for committing that terrorist attack. So we went into kind of a version of a post-truth world in which the information is too, too uh, kind of decentralized and really hard to know what's true. And that called for the Iraqi government, which was newly being created at the time to start passing uh, like laws to regulate free speech and regulate newspapers in the name of social cohesion. So it's like in order for us to, to kind of stop the civil war, we have to cancel many of the newspapers and be able to kind of shut down most speech that they consider to be, to be polarizing. And that's what I started, what I would say, one of the reasons why I started becoming active about this subject. In 2007, my first action of free speech is I translated the Bill of Rights into Arabic and distributing it across to all my, my friends in high school, which ended up getting me in one of the many death threats that I have received inside Iraq until I left in 2009. Ten years later, from me translating the, the, the Bill of Rights, I built one of the largest translation houses in the Middle East. 
which is called Beit al Hikmah 2.0, which we have translated roughly now 40 million words from English about books about free speech, science, human rights, into Arabic, Farsi, Kurdish, and Pashto. And one of our, we can probably say, one of our latest translations is Jacob's book, Free Speech. Uh, from from English into Arabic, and as well as we now kind of built a, a news channel that is focused on teaching people about critical thinking and the importance of liberties. So, so the subject that I'm going to be talking about today is 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 related to what what, what what I think we're facing right now, but translational repression, and I would say kind of the new version of what I consider to be authoritarianism, and that came into me during it kind of came in during COVID in which I saw there was a very viral video happening, shared by my cousin, of all people, uh, about a very fluent Arab speaker from CGTN. And for those of you who don't know what CGTN is, CGTN is the official channel of China. So it's kind of the Russia, uh, Russia Today equivalent in China. And now it is considered, I think, either the first or the second most viewed foreign channel in the Arab world with more than 14 million followers. And I was like, kind of really interested about, I mean, first, the reason why the video actually went viral was many people surprised that a Chinese looking person is speaking in a very fluent Arabic. So most of my friends were actually sharing the video, mainly it was like, okay, this Chinese person is speaking fluent Arabic. And that's how the video was actually going viral all across the Arabic internet, roughly around, around February, March, 2020. So then I, I started start watching the video. I was like, what, what is this video is actually mostly about? And the video, which is by CGTN, was claiming that the CIA was the reason behind coronavirus. And the fact that the US somehow sent uh, US soldiers to be trained inside China in Wuhan, and then these US soldiers are the one who took off the virus and spread it all over. And during that same video, they gathered a lot of subscribers on YouTube, on Facebook, or pretty much other channels. And then the kind of what I would co consider uh, a new version of authoritarianism being spread. So like what most people think of authoritarianism is what, what I was telling you about my own story about Saddam Hussein using chemical weapons against the Kurds and Bashar Assad killing people. But what China was selling to the Middle East and is selling to the Middle East is something completely different which is what I would call is like the Lamborghini style authoritarianism, in which if you sacrifice your liberties, you are actually gonna be rich and have a very good life. So they, they are selling kind of a, a Chinese version of the prosperity gospel, in which if you, if you actually follow what, what the Chinese model is, is, is doing, which is really about making everybody rich and making everybody prosperous, uh, and then in, in, in regard, you just have to kind of trust the leadership uh, uh, there, then you will be fine. And, and then they, they try to do very well in kind of creating comparisons between them and what's happening in a free society. So back to COVID, most of what they were showing is how kind of Donald Trump and the US government was kind of screwing up with the whole COVID relief and how they as Chinese have a, a great centralized model in which they were able to build hospitals in a couple weeks while the Americans are struggling and having dead bodies in New York and islands trying to struggle and how, how, how to deal with COVID. The other version is that they show women and like minorities walking in the streets of Beijing in, at 3 a.m. in the morning and say, and then they show like a video return in Baltimore of people like breaking down a CVS. And they're like, which kind of version of life you want to have? You want to have a centralized government where we are keeping the peace, harmony, coexistence, or you want this American version of life where people are, 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 are shooting at stores and whatever, a Black Lives Matter protest, destroying stores. They're like, there is two versions of, of the world right now. Do you want this version of when there is so-called freedom of speech and, and freedom, or you want our centralized version of surveillance and social cohesion and coexistence? The other version, of course, which is, I'm sure many of you might be familiar with in free societies, is the Uyghur situation. Is that they were showing how Han Chinese and even Uyghurs are like dancing in the streets and everybody is, is happy and they were kind of portraying that everything that is coming up from the West. Uh, and that's why even with the Hong Kong protest, if you do a survey right now of most of the Arab world, including larger countries like Iran, et cetera, you'll see most of it, they think of them as a CIA agents. And this is all like a made up story of actually, uh, whether it's the Hong Kong protest, whether it's the 
uh, it's what's happening with the Uyghurs, etc. These are all kind of a made up uh, situation. So, so that's um, the other f finding, which is af after we start doing more of the, of the research, which is really related to, to now, is that they show the, the so, I mean, the, what they call the Western hypocrisy. So the, the story of burning the Quran is in Sweden was very popular across the Middle East, popularized a lot by CGTN, by Press TV, which is the Iranian television, and by Russia Today. And to show like how so-called this freedom of speech, what it leads into is the burning of the Quran and, there is, and, and leads to discrimination against Muslims, etc. And that led to the burning of the Swedish office in Baghdad, where I come from, in which many of the people who were watching Press TV and CGTN, etc., who were kind of radicalized through many of these channels and information sources, that it was actually the Swedish government that directed the burning of the Quran. So if, if, if you ask for many of the people who do a lot of polls in the region, is that, as is the same with the Danish cartoons where, where Jacob was talking about, is that, they, that they, what they say is that it is actually many of these things are an actual direction of the Danish government, which is why you see in many protests across the larger Muslim world, including in Bangladesh, etc., is that people burn the embassies because they think that in, because many of the people exist in authoritarian states, they cannot even comprehend the idea that there is such a thing as a separation between the press and the state. So anything that they see uh, to showcase that even the West itself does not stand for these values. And, and then again, repeat the same kind of messaging about the fact that, okay, we are, uh, the system that we're trying to promote is better. In, in Turkey, uh, which is also holds a lot of, of uh, as a, based on the kind of the recent, recent events, and uh, post the elections of Erdogan, again, winning the elections, he was mentioning about how the fact that the West is banning kind of these pro-Palestine -pro protesters as the hypocrisy on the West, and he's using that as a tool to atta attack the Ataturk, the pro-Ataturk Republican Party, and saying is that if this is what the... Is that what the West that you're trying to defend or you want to be part of? Is that the European Union that you keep talking about that you want to join? They're a bunch of hypocrites. They burn the Quran, and then at the same time, when you're pro-Palestine, they ban you, which actually make it very important for those in, in Western countries, in my opinion, to actually stand for free speech and not apply these double standards and social cohesion and etc. laws that they are applied in the, reg in the region. In terms of actions that we are taking as an organization, we are uh, building a kind of a, a platform that shows kind of the slippery slope of censorship. So we're trying, starting first with, with kind of U.S. campuses where, where I'm based to try to show people kind of the slippery slope of authoritarianism. As, and we've seen it with countries like Turkey and, and, and Hungary and others in which it starts first. So we should not just go to the extremes of North Korea and and Iran and many places in which censorship is the norm. But we actually have now a lot of cases where, where it starts with kind of the beautiful things about how important it is to have social cohesion and we, ha and we have to kind of bring social order. And that's how generally it starts, with a very, what a beautiful things, as they say, like the road to destruction starts with good intentions. So they start with these kind of very nice buzzwords about how beautiful it is for us to coexist and all of that. And then slowly but surely, because many of these laws, especially the Turkish law and others are so vague, into the way you can actually persecute a lot of people under it. So if you say that, okay, anything that damages social cohesion, that can be interpreted as criticism of Erdogan because he's the leader and that is self is through social cohesion. And that's where you see a lot of the journalists and, and academics and actors in Turkey and other places getting jailed, mostly under the so-called social cohesion law. And we can see a lot of applications being applied in, in Malaysia, Singapore, and others. We really also have a lot of these kind of vague definitions. So I think it's very important. There is about 50% of the world or so lives under authoritarian regimes, according to Freedom House. So let's make sure that the other half doesn't become one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Faisal al Muhtar, very exciting, I have to say. I love the term Lamborghini authoritarianism, <laughs> that there is a trade-off going on for a certain lifestyle, but you have to let go of certain freedoms for others than the upper middle, middle class. That's the thing it is. And you may become complicit in what the state is doing also. They have more allies. We have our camera, no, microphone colleagues. 
Anyone uh, wanna com ask a question or compliment Faisal at all? I can do that. No, but we obviously have to move on to lunch. But I just want to know, you said something about like advances in technology are able to be helpful for this cause. When, when I looked this up before. Definitely. So, so it goes both ways. Um, I'm sure many of you have now heard about the surveillance camera now being installed in Iran in which they can detect if the woman is wearing a headscarf or not. So before, there was always that loophole in which you can have a policeman who is corrupt or you can bribe them or something like that. So now even that option, even that loophole, is now being replaced by artificial intelligence and all of that. Um, that is one thing. Now, the craziest story, which I, looks like a Black Mirror episode, was in, in the Uyghur land, in Xinjiang, where they, they do DNA sampling, biometrics, etc., and then they try to do, and that's the Atlantic did a full report on it, on how they try to like kind of screw up with different variables. So they beat somebody up at like 7 a.m. and then they see how he reacts at 9 a.m. and how he, and then through that they try to build human behavior modeling on the premise that they want they want to prevent a further protest. So in a way, it's like technology is definitely being utilized as as as, as a tool to expedite the speed of authoritarianism and the strength of it, um, which I think makes it extremely more and more difficult. As I said, like for anybody who is an activist and kind of been in the opposition forces, all what we look for is the loopholes in the system. Mm. And, and AI and many of this technology are making it more and more difficult to figure out that officer at the border who's sympathetic to the cause or something like that, you can work a deal with him. The now informal loopholes. Yes, the informal loopholes, mm -hmm. what I call the Habibi-style loopholes. Habibi-style loopholes, um, definitely. But, but now as these stuff are being removed, mm. then it becomes it more and more difficult to actually, because the AI is not a Habibi, you cannot make a deal with them. Mm. That is so many taglines coming from you today. <laughs> <laughs> quotes on quotes from Faisal Al Motar from Ideas Beyond Borders. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I could listen to you all day. Thank you so, so much. And now, um, sweet guests, we will take a lunch break. Lunch is served over here and we'll reconvene at 1.15. And for taxi, come to Natalie. Everyone knows everything? Great. And come to Natalie now, she wants me to add. Great. Thank you. We will soon hear from our panels and uh, I can just explain how the panels are going to work. We have two separate panels this afternoon and they're all going to consist of um, different speakers doing short presentations to begin with, their point of views, and then these will be commented on by corporate uh, rep representatives from Google and Meta. And in the end, we will have a joint Q&A, which you all can partake in. I hope you do. We have one people, person that's looking very questioning. <laughs> it's not for, towards me, maybe. Okay, if something is unclear, we'll reach to that point, I think. It will be very evident. Well, now I will introduce our first speaker that is with us on Zoom. And the panel, the first panel, the subject is hate speech, misinformation, disinformation, and counter speech. And we're going to hear about toolkits and methods in preventing that hate speech is going to lead to violence, incitement and such. And we're going to have Nicola Aitken from Meta in the end with a panel with Q&A from you and people watching online. And with that, I introduce on Zoom the founder and executive director of the Dangerous Speech Project. Her name is Susan Benesch and... The project studies speech that can inspire violence and works to find ways to prevent that violence without actually infringing on freedom of expression. Susan Benesch, I think you are with us. Well, yes, I welcome. Hope so. can you? Thank you so much. And a, a hand for mm -hmm. Susan, please. Thank you. Can you see my um, my slides? Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Um, so it's such a pleasure to be with you. Unfortunately, not in person in beautiful Stockholm, but this is also great. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, at my uh, little research team, which we call a Think Cup, since it's too small to be a think tank, 
Uh, it's called the Dangerous Speech Project. We work, um, as you've just heard, on various forms of harmful speech. We also search for the most effective responses to, to um, undermine such content without uh, engendering other harms, especially uh, without impinging on freedom of expression. We have done the most extensive study of counter speech um, as it is actually practiced, and especially of the counter speakers who do it. We find that in the little body of research that is emerging on counter speech, um, uh, there's uh, exceptionally little attention paid to what's actually being done already in the field and to the people who are doing it. So that's what we have concentrated on. We've learned a tremendous amount from counter speakers. Um, and I'm going to briefly offer you some of those ideas and then quickly give you some examples of that. Um, first of all, we, we uh, began six years ago looking to see if anybody was um, spontaneously responding to uh, hate speech, to disinformation, to um, uh, what we call dangerous speech, which is essentially content that inspires intergroup violence. Um, uh, I say spontaneously, I mean, we were looking for people who were doing this without, um, funding, without, uh, formal constitution from above by, um, by any authority, people who, uh, do this as a, uh, uh, let's say as a side job, and we were delighted to find that there are tens of thousands of people who are doing this in what we call constructive ways. Um, we conducted a global survey of civil society responses to hatred. Um, we studied more than 60, we found and studied more than 60 different projects and did in-depth interviews with 24 members of a large collective effort. Um, which was founded by Mina Dernard, from whom you will have the privilege of hearing directly, if you haven't already, at this meeting. My colleague, Kathy Berger, who is an anthropologist, did the majority of, of the interviews in what is, as far as we know, the only uh, ethnographic study of counter speakers. Um, and she's written some marvelous paintings, on, uh, uh, papers on her uh, findings, which you can find at dangerousspeech.org, uh, our website. Um, as you know, thousands or even millions of people are responding to, uh, uh, to hatred, to, uh, dangerous speech, to terrorist content, um, to disinformation, um, in ways that are meant to punish the people to whom they respond in ways that, uh, uh, express outrage and often, um, uh, try to inflict punishment of various kinds. Um, there are death threats, there is vitriol, um, there are demands that people get, get fired. Um, we are particularly interested not in that kind of effort, but in efforts that are meant to undermine the content to which people are responding, not its authors. Um, that leads us to our definition of counter speech, which is this. Um, it must be a direct response, notice, to other content, and that distinguishes it from counter-narrative, which is any expression of opinion or facts that contradict another narrative without necessarily responding directly to it. Um, what do we mean by undermine? Uh, for the vast majority of counter-speakers we have studied, uh, this means attempting to shift discourse norms in the audience, in the large, much larger number of people who are witnesses to an exchange of speech online. Uh, I say much larger because those people are almost always more numerous than the people who are posting the hateful um, or dangerous content. So our counter speakers are interested in that audience. They are generally not trying to convert the person to whom they respond. And that's quite a striking finding. It undermines the old adage, don't feed the trolls. After all, um, they are not, in fact, feeding the trolls. They are trying to feed uh, the rest of uh, uh, the, the audience, as we call it. Um, and effectively, they're trying to feed the rest of society, which is terrifically important since you need a significant shift 
um, of a critical mass of people in a society for things to go really wrong um, <clears throat> on a on a societal level. Uh, so it's the, the first of our key findings that the counter speakers we studied are in most cases trying to shift norms of discourse and behavior. Um, that is the first of our key findings. Um, let me offer you then three more important points from our findings. Um, the first is that uh, as counter speakers have so eloquently said, it is important for, for society and in fact for, for uh, democratic life, for successful uh, 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 practice of democracy, uh, that people do counter speech. Um, Hasnain Kazim, a German journalist, about whom I'll tell you just a bit in a moment, expresses this very eloquently. He says, uh, we effectively, he says, we must exercise this muscle. We must argue publicly with people uh, with whom we disagree. Uh, the second uh, extra point that, that I want to uh, offer you from our findings is that counter speech is not only good for society, we have found that uh, in some ways it is good for the counter speakers, uh, it, particularly when they practice counter speech in groups. Um, some of the organizations, in particular I Am Here, founded by, by Mina, um, provide for their members support, um, reassurance, uh, a sense of, of, of community, and solidarity um, that many of the counter speakers we we uh, interviewed say uh, made them feel better about conversing online than they did before they joined such a group. So before that, they were they were um, observing uh, and sometimes hearing terrible content and feeling um, powerless about it. And then the practice of counter speaking, although it can be, of course, uh, very dispiriting. Um, uh, shocking and sometimes even frightening can also uh, can also be bolstering. Um, in this, I, I want to slip in the point that uh, counter speakers uh, uh, function uh, both in groups, as I've mentioned, and of course as individuals. We found that um, many or most of the individuals are responding to attacks on them on themselves. Uh, in the case of groups, more of the group participants are, we could say, allies, are people who are not themselves being attacked, not even members of the groups who are most attacked, um, but, but um, of course, feeling a, a sense of outrage and, and solidarity with people who are targets of uh, hate speech or dangerous speech. And then the final uh, finding that I want to offer you of, 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 of new, many that we have found, but but time is quite limited. Uh, it's that uh, the counter speakers' goals are quite uniform in general. They are what I've what I've mentioned to you that they're trying to shift discourse norms in the audience, but their communicative strategies, that is to say, how they counter speak, uh, varies very uh, significantly. So now I'm going to close by quickly giving you a few examples of that. Um, I uh, know that I'm speaking to an audience in Stockholm, and so I don't dare to pronounce the original Swedish name for this extraordinary group. Uh, uh, the Swedish speakers among you will know that uh, it means I am here. Um, uh, one of the most, uh, extra one of the many extraordinary things about this effort, this counter speech effort, uh, is that it has been uh, replicated in more than a dozen different countries. And so in each country, it is named, of course, uh, with uh, I am here in the relevant language. Um, there are more than 100,000 people participating in the various countries. Um, and the other uh, uh, highly unusual and uh, um, encouraging feature of it that I want to point out is that it has continued for a long time. Um, for years, uh, most um, counter speech efforts uh, that we've studied have have been interesting, impressive, ingenious, but but relatively limited in duration. This particular one um, 
is unusual in its uh, extraordinary staying power. Since you have uh, its founder with you, I will not. Uh, I will not uh, describe it more, since you 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 can't do better than obviously hearing from um, from its founder and ongoing director. Uh, this is um, one example um, of a of a counter speech uh, method that we describe as amplification. This is very contrarian. You know that um, most responses to to harmful content online have to do with trying to get rid of it. Um, this is just the opposite. This is um, an effort from Brazil. It was a response to a terrible surge in racism online. Um, a Brazilian NGO and an advertising firm worked together to make this campaign that was called um, uh, uh, Mirrors of Racism. And they took terrible content terrible racist comments online and literally amplified them, made them enormous and put them on billboards in the neighborhoods where the people who posted the consequence, the, the uh, uh, content live. And as you can see, um, each example had a tagline, virtual racism has real consequences. Um, this, this form of counter speech is designed to oblige the audience to recognize that there is such terrible content circulating online and offline in their society. Here's another example. This is Dylan Maron. Uh, he is an actor, author, and cultural critic in the United States who, who first made his name for humorous and critical content. Um, he had um, he was terribly attacked uh, as a as a gay Latino uh, person and began to seek out the people who had attacked him and in fact uh, sought to talk to them in telephone conversations, which he turned into a podcast and then a book called Conversations with People Who Hate Me. It is compulsively interesting. Um, and he practices what he calls radical empathy. He tries to understand the people who have attacked him and tries to empathize with him. Um, I mentioned Haznain uh, a little bit earlier. Um, he uh, uh, is a very active counter speaker who began, who made a resolution to respond to every hateful attack on him beginning January 1st, 2016. Um, his particular uh, secret method, not so secret method, is humor. He's enormously funny. Um, sometimes uh, at the expense of the people who attack him. He also uh, spends enormous effort in thoughtfully, carefully responding to some of the questions that um, angry readers send him. Yep. A couple of minutes left on the presentation. Yes, yes, if you I have a couple of up. minutes left also. Thank you. Um, as Haznaïn says, uh, quoting Antoine Saint-Exupéry, the, the French author, don't forget that your sentence is an act. He has spent enormous effort counter-speaking and also written three books about it, the first of which um, you see the cover of here on the slide. Um, he, he argues very, very um, eloquently and powerfully that uh, one must practice counter-speech in order to, as I said earlier, to keep that muscle limber. Uh, I, I um, of course, could tell you much more, but I, I want to respect the time limit. And so with that, here's my email, here's our website, and I look forward to your questions in the Q&A. Yes. Very, very interesting. Much. Thank you, Susan Benish, with us on Zoom on counter speech. Thank you. And continuing on this matter, we introduce a Danish political scientist here with us today, a professor at Aarhus University. Currently, he is the director of the very exciting Research on Online Political Hostility Project, ROPH. And he examines the causes and consequences of online hate speech and misinformation. So this will be the next presentation. And then we have a Q&A at the very end. So remember questions, please. And welcome Mikael Bang Peterson. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, 
thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here to talk about how we can try to address some of the hostile content there is uh, online, uh, but focusing more on how we can empower other users uh, in this uh, context. I'm a little bit unsure whether the clicker works. No, yes, thank you very much. So what I'll be talking about is uh, similar to what you just heard, but now focusing on disinformation. And disinformation, as uh, many of you would uh, know, uh, is a false, incorrect, or misleading information that was created to deceive. There's often a distinction between disinformation and misinformation, where misinformation is the same kind of false content, but where it was not necessarily made uh, to deceive, but just happens to be uh, wrong. Um, but I think most of the points that I'll make uh, today applies just as much to disinformation uh, as it does to misinformation. Um, if we if we look about if we look on disinformation and misinformation, then it's a huge public uh, concern. Uh, there was a recent uh, global survey that uh, estimated that around half uh, of the globe's population, or at least uh, online population, uh, was concerned about what is real and what is fake. So this is something to look into. Ah, okay. So what exactly is it that we should be concerned about when it comes to disinformation? Well, the, the way that I look added uh, is that uh, while we talk a lot about disinformation and misinformation, it is actually relatively rare uh, compared to the sheer amount of information on the internet. So estimates differ uh, from study to study, from platform to platform, but uh, studies of uh, misinformation on, for example, uh, Twitter uh, estimates that it's between 1% and 5% of all news links uh, that they are to untrustworthy uh, websites. And that's, so that's, that's the percentage compared to news links. Uh, if we compare to the overall amount of posts, then it's around uh, 0.001% uh, of the posts uh, that contain misinformation. If we go from Twitter to Facebook, then estimates are uh, slightly higher. But still, overall, it is, it is less than what you would often see from a public debate. It's also important to say that, that misinformation and disinformation is not shared by that many people. Uh, sort of one illustration is during the COVID uh, pandemic, where the so-called disinformation dozen was uh, identified, which was uh, 12 uh, social media accounts that were responsible for 60% of all circulated uh, misinformation about COVID vaccines. What we have done in our research is to estimate that if we look on Twitter during the US presidential uh, election in 2016, there are around 10% of users were responsible for 100% of uh, the sharing of untrustworthy uh, news. So most people actually don't share anything on social media and the group that are sharing a lot of misinformation is a very, very select group of individuals. These uh, super sharers are often political activists. They sort of know what they do in the sense that they actually are higher on average, according to our research, than uh, in terms of political knowledge than the average uh, user. What really distinguishing is, distinguishes them is that they have an intense hatred uh, for the political outgroup, and that is essentially the underlying motivator of uh, the sharing activity. So that means that the random uh, internet user or social media user is actually not that likely to share anything and definitely not to share uh, misinformation. So from that perspective, the, the key problem from, uh, from the overall uh, or from the majority of users uh, is what you can say incidental exposure to misinformation, that they just sort of a few times will run into disinformation on the internet. And, and the people who are the super sharers, they are really in a sense lost causes uh, that are driven by other motivations than what we can easily 
correct. So how can we how can we deal with these uh, incidental uh, exposures? Well, this is where counter speech uh, comes in, and I think it's helpful to think about two different forms of counter speech when it comes to disinformation. So we can think about active counter speech, uh, where platforms, communities, authorities, they can go in and engage in so-called debunking, where they fact check uh, the stories that are in circulation, and they put on labels uh, saying this is true, this is not true, and then circulate those labels. Um, there's also another form of more sort of active counter speech, and that is to facilitate so-called pre-bunking, where you don't sort of go after the, the stories uh, that when they are in circulation, but you try to turn people into fact checkers themselves, such that they are ready to meet uh, false content when they are exposed uh, to it. From so this is what communities can do. They can facilitate pre-bunking. They can try to turn the users into fact-checkers themselves. And what can individual users do? Well, they can heed those advice uh, and, and essentially be aware that there is some, that not everything they'll meet on the internet is uh, true, uh, and pay attention to that and uh, develop awareness. So if we take a little of a closer look on these different kinds of counter speech, then, then there are some challenges to the debunking um, path. And that is that, well, we know it works. So when you're exposed to a fact checking uh, or a fact check news, uh, then if it's true, then you're more likely to believe it and more likely uh, to pass it on. But the problem is that if you have an escalating crisis, such as the war uh, between Hamas and Israel, then you have a massive influx of information, and it's really difficult to fact-check those things at scale and in real time. Um, so, so I think it's unlikely that debunking will be a general uh, solution uh, to the problem of, uh, of the circulation of uh, dis and misinformation. That doesn't mean that uh, debunking is not very important in a democracy. And we know that fact-checking uh, organizations, one of the key advantages is that they actually help keep political elites from lying because they know that they will be fact-checked. So I'm all for fact-checking. I just don't think that, it's the, that it will solve everything in terms of uh, disinformation. What we can do is then to move from debunking to also focus on this concept of pre-punking, where we try to turn people into fact-checkers themselves. And there are, there are a number of different kinds of interventions that show promise, where if users are exposed to, to sort of advice on how to spot fake news through gamified interventions, but also sort of just uh, sort of literacy interventions where they are told that this is, this is how you identify uh, a false news story. So this is what you should uh, pay attention to. And what the research shows is that it sort of requires two things to become a, a good fact checker uh, yourself as a social media user. First, you need some initial tips that build your competences to sort of tell right from wrong. But you also need to sort of have constant rem uh, reminders that, hey, remember to be motivated to focus on what is true and what is not true. So you need to have a combination of initial competence building intervention and these constant reminders. And that is something that platforms and authorities and so on can uh, do uh, to facilitate uh, this way of empowering the audiences to become fact checkers themselves. It's so this is an example of the kind of advice uh, that, uh, uh, that you can use to uh, do pre-bunking. And it's like none, none of this will be surprising. It's pretty easy uh, and simple and straightforward advice. But the studies does, uh, just, does show that it actually does enable people to uh, tell uh, right from wrong to some extent. One final point when it comes to empowering audiences through pre-bunking is that what is important is not just to make people as critical as possible. It's not just say, don't trust anything. 
some of the research that we have been do doing suggests that what, what you really need to cultivate in terms of a virtue is humility. That rather than sort of extreme skepticism, then cultivate humility, a sense of, well, I might be wrong, and what I meet might also not entirely be true, but, but it's very important that we don't cultivate extreme skepticism because that kind of psychological state will, will often actually make, make people question those things that are true also. So the sort of underlying virtue that should be cultivated through these, um, through these uh, interventions is intellectual humility. And uh, with that, I want to say... Uh, Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that, Mikael Bang Petersson, very elegantly with the time as well. Now we will learn more about a very interesting AI powered toolkit for counter speech, created in part by our next speaker, slowly moving to the stage by the name Jesse Spencer Smith and from Future for Free Speech. Jesse is a professor and chief data scientist and interim director for the Data Science Institute at Vanderbilt University. And I think we're all eager to hear what he has to say about this AI-powered app. Thank you. Welcome, Jesse. Right, thank you. Thank I think you so he's much. here to help you about mm -hmm. setup, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, your, your time and attention. So, uh, and thank you for helping get set up. So, in conversations with uh, Jakob, we asked the question, what would it look like to empower someone to respond to hate speech online? So, uh, it can be a, 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 a difficult thing to do. First of all, there's the, the, the lift of actually uh, rising to, to wanting to, to respond. Uh, then there is the, uh, uh, the, the challenge of, uh, of actually authoring something. Uh, there's the challenge of, of trying to get it right uh, and, and even knowing what would be an effective response. That's a big lift for an individual, especially big lift when you consider that the idea is that you would like to be able to respond quickly to hate speech because you want to have your response be up near the top, you want to be there for the conversation, and if you're having to go through all of that, it can be a difficult thing to do uh, in real time. So uh, I'm a chief data scientist at the Data Science Institute, and we have students and graduate students that are interested in, in solving problems using uh, artificial intelligence, and, and we take on many different types of projects each, uh, uh, each semester. And so we took this on as, as one of the projects for a team of, of students uh, and one of our staff data scientists to, to see what might be possible to, to come up with. And so uh, we, we came up with, uh, with an application, and this is a technology demonstration of what's possible, uh, named the Frequalizer by uh, Jacob. And uh, uh, this is a human-in-the-loop response. And the idea here is that you want to be able to respond to hate speech, but you would like to be able to do this uh, knowing and having an idea of the, some of the background of what you're responding to. Are you truly understanding it? Did you get everything in there? Or is some nuance in there that you didn't understand? Second, you'd like to have that response, uh, uh, your response to, to, uh, you know, to be aligned with your principles, to, uh, of course, to be in your, your, your voice, and also be effective. We want to achieve all those things. So uh, in this application, uh, uh, first of all, uh, you'll, you'll notice that you can actually uh, uh, create an account for yourself. I'm going to go ahead and log in here to, uh, to my account here. And you're going to see that, uh, 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 let's see. So I have an account. I'm putting in my password. And when I'm in, you're going to notice a couple of things. One, it's asked me to input my principles. So here I've, I've listed what's important to me. Uh, and then it also asks for writing samples. And the idea here is that uh, these are, are, are statements that you've made. This is not actually me. Can anybody guess who, is, uh, who this is meant to emulate here? So I'm actually taking on a persona. Anybody can guess who this might be? Frederick Douglass. 
So this is uh, in the style of Frederick Douglass. Uh, not actual quotes, but synthesized quotes from, from Frederick, Frederick Douglass, just meant as a demonstration for you. So the idea here is that I now want to be able to respond to a hate speech. Uh, now, ideally, of course, I'd, I'd put in the account setup my own writing, but I just wanted to demonstrate to you that you can take on and, and that it will adopt your uh, way of, of speaking. So here, here's what happens. So you paste the original post that you're responding to. The first thing that happens, and this does take some time for, the, for, the, for this to run, is it first comes up with background information on the original post. So what is it actually discussing? Is there anything that you're missing in what it's discussing? Then it drafts a response in your voice, respecting your principles, in your style of writing, and following uh, practices for responding to hate speech. Then it gives you an assessment of the response because you're, you have all these differing, uh, 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 you have some tension between your style of writing, your principles, and what might be the best way of responding. So this is simply giving you feedback on how well your response might be going, and then it gives you an opportunity to request a new draft. If it leaves something else, you can just request a new draft. So let's actually try this out. Let's see how, how well this works. Uh, we're going to need to have some, uh, some hate speech to start with. Uh, uh, this is just a document that, that gives you some background. Uh, here's a hate speech example. This is a slight rewarding. Does anybody recognize this from being in the news recently? Yeah. This is, this is the tweet that Elon Musk actually responded to, you, you, you speak the truth, something along those lines. So let's see actually what, uh, uh, what, what happens. So we're going to put this in here. And keep in mind that right now my, my uh, writing is in the style of uh, Frederick Douglass. I'm going to ask for about uh, 50 words in response here. And again, this is going to take a, a little bit of time to, to generate uh, one way to, to tell that it's actually running is you can go up here and see the running icon. So, and again, what's going to be happening is we have to balance all of these different types of, of responses. So, uh, uh, so here, the post appears to be promoting anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, which are a common form of hate speech. Okay, so where did this come from? This is actually just purely from GPT-4. So we say, this is the background that we think is important here. It can get it wrong, which is why this is being shown to you and why we're separating out these two parts of the prompt. So we're saying, first, give me background on it. Then we're explicitly taking that output and then using that for the next step. Because otherwise, what we were realizing was happening was that we we're asking for a draft response, which meant too much was happening automatically. What's actually what was being requested or what was being, what was being discussed in the original post. So we separated these out so you could see and assess. So is this right? Is it wrong? Is it culturally relevant? This is up to you to decide. That's why it has to be human in the loop. This is GPT-4. Is it correct? You will need to be the, the judge, but it does give you at least a start. And here, it's actually not too bad. Uh, so it picks up a, a dialectic. Um, and so it, it seems to pick up and, uh, in a way that uh, uh, Elon Musk might not have what's really going on in that post. So uh, my style of writing was, was Frederick Douglass. In the face of such divisive rhetoric, let's remember the strengths of our diversity. Stereotypes seek to divide us, but we must stand united, affirming the dignity of every community. Um, not too bad, but... but pretty general, so we're going to ask for a redraft in just a moment. Um, the assessment of it I, adheres well to the guidelines, uh, promotes positive dialogue, emphasizes unity, tolerance, and coexistence. All right, but I'm going to ask for a new drafter. I'm going to say, uh, please redraft uh, uh, speaking uh, more uh, directly to the post, to the uh, yeah, to the post. Let's see if it, if it can give us something which is uh, a little bit more about that, because this is a very general type of statement here. And we'll see how well it does in uh, as it finishes running. Then the other thing that we will do... Okay, here we go. 
Your post appears to be promoting harmful and baseless anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. All right, so Jewish communities, like all communities, are diverse. So now we've, re, we, we've recast this. Uh, is it perfect? No, it's gotten much longer. Uh, models are actually terrible at counting. They're terrible at counting words. So this is always approximate, which is why I was very careful to say that this is a technology demonstration. But this gives you an idea and a sense of what's possible uh, and to, to lower the bar to quickly uh, respond to hate speech online. But let's actually see how well it, it, it captures the voice of the individual. Um, does anybody remember, uh, uh, it was a couple of years ago, when Johnny Cash's daughter uh, began to post online, and this became famous, in the voice of Jane Austen, and would respond to various events in the voice of Jane Austen. Does anyone remember this? Uh, well, I live in Nashville, and she lives there as well. So let's go ahead and, uh, and, and get some samples of Jane Austen. So I asked for some examples of Jane Austen responding to generalized hate speech online. And, uh, and here, is, here are some of the things that it came up with in an age where civility ought to reign. It grieves one to witness words steeped in such ungentlemanly sentiment. So we're going to just see how well this, uh, the, uh, this changes when we give uh, this different uh, setup here. So we're going to go back here. I'm going to change my style of writing to Jane Austen. I'm going to save the changes, and then I'm going to respond to that same post, and we'll see what this sounds like. So here's the post, and then we're going to give it a moment to, uh, to generate here. And we'll ask for 40 words again. So a couple of things here. First of all, this is a technology demonstration. So really what we're doing here is, is really just a, a, a series of prompts running against a large language model. Um, uh, more could be done with this if, 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 it's, uh, if it's found to be useful. But the idea here is to empower individuals or individuals working as part of an organization uh, to respond uh, more uh, quickly uh, and with less um, effort. Uh, I, I, with less cost to us personally. In our shared journey, let's remember that diversity enriches us, not divides. Stereotypes and conspiracy theories only serve to sow discord. Let's strive for understanding, respect, and, un uh, hum and humanity. All right, so not, uh, uh, not, 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 not too bad. Um, let's go ahead and just ask for, uh, please uh, make the response more cutting and funny. And we'll try one more. So, what's possible? This is a simple technology demonstration. One thing that we did not do here was uh, uh, too much of an assessment of the possible impact of this. So, one possibility would be to uh, Oh, this isn't sounding too much like Jane Austen anymore, but, uh, but it certainly is getting more cutty. Uh, uh, diversity is like a good party mix. Mm, not Jane Austen anymore, but still it is more cutting and more funny. So the assessment adheres well to the guidelines. Could be more concise and fact-based. Not bad. So next steps. First of all, this is really leaving out uh, an analysis of what might happen, what might be the downstream effects of your counter speech. Who is it likely to affect? Is it going to be effective? Uh, is it going to be effective for the different audiences that you might care to reach? So this is the, the research that's being undertaken by, the, by many of the folks in this room and is a possible future extension using agents to actually do an analysis. So one thing uh, during lunch conversation that, uh, that came up was the possibility of having an ensemble of uh, assessment of responses. So how is this likely to affect people who are silent readers versus those who are active versus uh, the person who originally uh, posted uh, the response? These are things that you can actually do with large language models. Large language models don't have to just be generating the responses for you. They can be augmenting the responses of individuals. So uh, 
Final message here is AI doesn't need to be used to detect and take down or centrally moderate. AI can also be used to empower individuals to respond in an effective uh, way uh, that uh, uh, empowers us as, as individuals to make meaningful uh, and impactful responses. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Jesse, stay on stage, please. And we can be joined by Michael Bang Peterson. If you want to come and join us on stage, because now we, I mean, this is incredible. I want to try this right away. Did you notice the papers with QR codes? This is your entry to using this platform. So take one with you as you leave. And now we present uh, Nicola Aitken, who is here with us. She is Meta's lead for external engagement on misinformation and responsible AI within the trust and safety organization. Here to have her comments on what has been said by these three experts. So please welcome Nicola Aitken. Welcome. Hi. Do you want me to stand? You can have a state or stand. Yeah. It's up to you. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's really an honor to be invited, and it's amazing to be sharing the stage with these incredible speakers. Um, as I have been introduced, so I work at Meta. I sit in our um, trust and safety content policy team, and really my job is to help understand the kind of external research that's happening, get kind of independent feedback when we're helping to create our policies or launch new products. Um, so I'm going to kind of start by just giving a very brief overview of how we think about counter speech at Meta, and then I'm going to share some kind of thoughts on, uh, I'm sorry to say, open questions about some of the themes that we've heard today. So at Meta, really our challenge is how we think about these issues at scale. We are a global platform, we have billions of users, that means billions of pieces of content. And unfortunately, that does mean large numbers of hate speech, of misinformation. Um, and so it's how do we manage that at the scale that we have? And so there's kind of you know, two ways that we are thinking about kind of counter speech or counter narratives. And I tried to fit this into your passive versus active grouping, but I uh, was getting a little bit uh, confused myself as to which one fits into which category. So maybe you can advise on that later. But the way, um, the kind of two categories that I'm thinking about this is one, how we kind of provide alternative information and two, how we provide interventions that are a bit more of a, a think again kind of intervention. So in that first category of thinking about providing alternative information, we have various um, ways that we try and do that across kind of hate speech and misinformation. Um, I'm, I'm using misinformation, by the way, because at Meta we generally don't try to assume intent. So I'm saying misinformation, but really I mean a lot of what, of what Michael's talking about as well. Um, so one of the ways that we do that is that we have what we call our information hubs. These are parts of um, Facebook, of Instagram, where you can go to learn more about specific topics. One of those is climate change. Climate change is an area where we see a lot of misinformation. We see a lot of um, abuse as well coming from that. So we have this kind of independent space with uh, factual knowledge that people can go to. Another um, kind of intervention that we have is what we call our search redirect prompt. So if people are searching for hateful or extremist terms, um, on Facebook or Instagram, then we will kind of redirect them to alternative resources. So that's kind of another way. We're also thinking a lot about pre-bunking as well. Michael mentioned this, um, pre-bunking in terms of how can we help educate people about the types of misinformation tactics that they might see on our platforms? How can we get them to kind of think a little bit more critically? And finally, we are trying to kind of share the experiences of people who have been impacted by kind of hateful language or hateful attacks, um, kind of extremism, these sorts of things. So let people kind of see the other side almost. That second category, uh, second category then of like think again interventions. So here we have things like our fact checking labels. So where you will see a piece of content um, and we're kind of saying, well, this independent group has said that this is potentially partly false or, or totally false. So maybe you want to think again when you're resharing it, when people try to share the content, we have this kind of pop up. Um, similarly, we have interventions on Instagram where if people are writing a comment or a post that we think could be uh, harassment or abusive, then we have a pop-up that says, this comment could be seen as abusive. Do you want to think before you post it? So we have these kind of various ways to try and encourage people to just really think about the information that they're seeing on their platforms. We do also provide a lot of support for a number of different kind of counter-speech interventions. I won't 
kind of list them off. We do have a specific website, so counterspeech.fb.com, where you can go read about some of the support that we're giving to different initiatives, see some of the resources that we have there. So now just to kind of think about um, some of the themes and reflections that we've heard throughout today. One of the things I've been reflecting on a lot is the differences as well as the similarities between kind of hate speech or misinformation and disinformation. And so I want to talk a bit about um, kind of definitions, first of all. So while there's kind of no general, like no universally agreed definition of hate speech, generally we can come up with a list of terms, of phrases, even emojis that can be used in a hateful manner. And we can search for that type of content and we can kind of re refute it um, relatively clearly as much as we need to make sure that we're keeping that up to date and, and make sure that keep, we are aware of it keeping changing. For misinformation, it's a lot harder. Misinformation is, is constantly changing. Um, I was sharing with a few of you in the breaks that we had this example very recently where um, one of our fact-checking partners had fact-checked a claim that a hospital in Palestine had been bombed a couple of weeks ago. And this was false. There was a lot of independent reporting to say the hospital has not been bombed, it's not been attacked. And so we fact-checked that content. A large amount of content that was being shared got this fact-check label. Two days later, that hospital was in fact bombed. And so we had to kind of very quickly go back and change the labeling that we had in place. So misinformation is constantly changing and something that could be shared as a way to try and create division um, could then actually become truthful and become accurate. So it's much harder to keep on top of. But in terms of thinking about the similarities, they are both very value based. And so thinking about how we refute both hate speech or misinformation, we really need to understand what is driving it and why people are trying to share that content. Um, during the COVID pandemic, one thing we saw was a lot of misinformation about um, vaccines being shared. But really for a lot of people, they were sharing that because they were concerned. They, were, they had a lot of concern about their family and friends and wanted to make sure that they had information if they were going to potentially be harmed. And so that type of value-based sharing I think is very different to, to some of what we see in hate speech as well but you know it, it's kind of a, a hard thing to tackle. The second thing then um, like thinking about how we respond to this again I mentioned at the beginning at Meadow we're really trying to think about how we deal with this at scale so we've seen a lot of really fantastic organizations individuals today who are doing kind of counter speech uh, initiatives so how can we amp how can we at Meta amplify these efforts? How can we kind of make sure that it's reaching a much bigger audience? And related to that, what is the role of AI? And I'm really interested in the kind of AI app that we've just seen. Um, is there a way that we can responsibly kind of integrate some of that technology onto our platforms? Um, I don't have answers. As I said it's some big questions here. Uh, and then the third area is how do we learn and improve and really understand the impact of the counter speech interventions that we're trying to put in place here. What does success look like in this space? What does it look like if you're an individual counter, um, trying to do a counter speech, if you're an organization, if you're a company like Meta? Um, I think these are areas that we do, haven't quite cracked yet. Um, we still don't really have a good um, data on things like the impact of pre-bunking initiatives. So these are kind of some of the areas that I am thinking about and I would love to get the thoughts of the panel as yeah. well. Yeah, we have to open up for discussion. And once again, I ask my dear uh, microphone colleagues to make themselves available for you to serve you with microphone, your speaking ability. Uh, at first, I would just like to uh, add hand. Uh, maybe you guys want to react to Nicholas' statements to begin with. I, or do you have any questions for Nicola? I, 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 I did have a, a, a question about uh, 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 sort of rolling AI into, into a large platform. So we are always interested in augmenting as much as possible rather than sort of uh, entirely automating, right? So what, what might that look like to augment individuals, to empower individuals? Is that, is that possible to do uh, platform-wide? Yeah, I think that's a that's the question, right? I mean, so we have these interventions, as I mentioned, for kind of harassment. So that's an AI system is reading the comment that you're writing, um, and there's a pop up that says, actually, this could be abusive. Do you want to rethink it? So you know, maybe that's a, an application where 
some of the AI can be rolled out more thoroughly. Um, we have our, we've, we've launched in the US as a pilot program, uh, AI chatbots, including a Jane Austen one. Um, and so maybe there's an inter... Perennial favorite. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, so maybe there's some sort of kind of interaction there that we can um, bring in some of these tools in that format as well. But uh, I think it's an open question. Yeah. yeah. And here we have our audience question. Yeah, first of all, thank you all three of you. It's been really, really interesting. And Nicola, I completely agree that the field has not defined success yet, especially depending on who the audience is. But this is a question to Jesse. I, I could not help uh, notice words like scapegoat, eradicate, truth in your uh, counter speech that was generated. And I, I understand that Douglas might have something to do with that. Yes. But um, what we see in this research is that counter speech can also be hateful. Did you check whether your model is creating hateful counter speech or, or how your AI generated speech has that potential? Because I, I, I have a hunch that if you put your own counter speech in as if it were the hate speech, the chat GPT would have told you that it was hateful. Maybe. And so you'll, you'll recall that there was the assessment at the uh, also, but the assessment is, 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 was very general. Right, and we did not, and, and that did not say, is this itself hate speech? But that uh, that was actually quite interesting too. Uh, that, that that occurred to me as well. Uh, that uh, that some of what it could generate, especially uh, if if you're uh, writing samples, were themselves hateful. So, but then again, this is if that is what you want to generate, then it could be what you're what you're generating. But yes, I, I think that actually was wording that uh, that that you might see more with uh, with uh, Frederick Douglass. Um, I, I, I think that uh, uh, this this is a problem of uh, what is effective, right? And being able to measure what that effectiveness should be, and depending on the on the the, the groups that you're trying to reach with this as well, because we just don't know now. So, uh, uh, is the, would this application actually be effective? I don't know because I don't know how this might be measured. But as, as has been stated by Mina Dennett and many other that people that want to engage in counter speech just don't feel like they are actually uh, knowledgeable enough. So this could be a that. support system, a support tool. Do we have any more questions from oh, the audience? Thank if you. I could, if I could, I'll, yes, I'll add one more thing, just a quick story. So it was recently, just a couple of weeks ago at uh, Medical Informatics Group. Uh, we, we do lots of different work in AI. And one of the things that, uh, that the doctors very, very much liked was using AI to, res to draft initial responses to texts from patients, because more and more doctors are getting texts from patients requesting information Patients can be in pain, they can be in bad moods, and uh, for, uh, for these doctors, it was a huge lift. They said, you know, after I answered just 10 texts, I feel exhausted. Until I started to use AI to do the very first draft, I can edit it completely, but just getting that first draft so it's not emotional, I'm not responding to, to them, I can do that later once I have the words on the page, and then I can do a much better job responding. And outsourcing. that is what plays. Yeah, outsourcing yeah. emotional stability. We have a question here from Fritz Ood, Norge. Yes, thank you. My name is Joachim from Freebird <coughs> Foundation in Oslo. So it's been really interesting to listening to all three of you. And um, one thing that comes to my mind, one uh, scenario that I would be a bit scared of is that if we do counter speech and we get this reputation that this is only AI generated, uh, how, how do you see this, um, this problem? Thank you. I, I, I think that's why it must be human in, in the loop, and also where we realized that it was really important to have the individual's principles and their writing style as well, and something to get on the page, and we try to encourage editing with that as well, because otherwise it, it all sounds the same, and I don't know about you, but when you see AI-generated stories, and they're not for, you know, you're just like, oh, I know what this is, and, and, you, and you don't even read it, and we certainly didn't want to have that happen here. Anyone else? Maybe a couple of final questions before we move on to panel two, this last panel of the day. For now, I want to ask, oh, Jacob has a, I just want to ask, um, well, we have you here, Nicola. Uh, Meta and platforms as such has been criticized for having mechanisms that favor and promote negative responses, negative feelings. What have you done about that basic issue? Yeah, this is absolutely um, an issue that's really important to us. So we, first of all, we would sort of refute the argument that we are trying to promote divisive or harmful content um, because our take is that we're not trying to encourage people 
to stay on the platform if they're not having a good experience. We want people to continue to come back to the platforms, continue to open up Instagram, and you're not going to do that if you're not having an enjoyable time, if you feel like you're wasting your time arguing with people or being abused, etc. So kind of from a principle perspective, we we don't want to be amplifying that type of content. Um, of course, unfortunately, some of the signals can get mixed up there. So um, you know, when we think about how we rank content on Instagram, a lot of the signals that we use are, is it, are people engaging with this? Are people commenting on it? Are they liking it? Are they sharing it to their friends? And that can get um, abused and that can get kind of mixed up. But our, we, we have what we call our kind of uh, ranking and recommendation guidelines, which are actually stronger than our community standards. So even though content might not break our community standards, it we might still demote it or just not recommend it to people because it falls below the bar that we have for recommendation guidelines. So that's one of the new areas that we brought in the last couple of years to try and address this issue. Mm. But it's it's an ongoing challenge. Jacob, yes, thank Super you. Super short question to to Michael. Uh, can do you does your research show anything about the effectiveness of uh, uh, pre bunking versus, for instance? Um, uh, removal censorship uh, um, when it comes to, to disinformation what what uh, are what's what's the response of users what's the, what are the psychological reactions to to people who get get censored versus uh, pre-bunked or, or or encounter counter speech so I, I think one of the, so for, first of all, if we look at the effectiveness of pre-bunking interventions, then, then they do seem to be, be effective, but like all interventions, they, the effects are small and, and we need those reminders to, to keep them uh, going. Uh, I think it has some advantages uh, to go the pre-bunking uh, route. Uh, and and one is that that we know that censorship is something that can help radicalize those being censored. So there are studies suggesting if you are banning uh, users, for example, then they move on to more fringe platforms and are often there then uh, sort of uh, venting their frustrations in all sorts of ways. Whereas essentially pre-bunking, what that entails is essentially do do nothing. That that you uh say well here's something that's false and then you uh, just sort of move move on and i think in in general uh, a lot of uh, we would be uh in a much better place if people simply ignored and by people i also mean the media uh if if they simply ignored what happened on social media because often the real accelerator of misinformation or exposure to misinformation is when when the mass media sort of picks it up and, and blows it up uh on on their pages not the first time my my occupation is attacked on stage today but i i get i get the gist of it thank you so much we say to the first panel of the day very very useful thank you i look forward to using all of these tools Thank you. And we make room for our next speakers and next panel. The next panel, thank you, will be on content moderation, trends and practices. And before we engage our guests, we have a few words from our, should we say, uh, initiative taker, Jacob Mashagama. Go ahead. Oh. And while he's getting mic'd up, I can say that there will be more speakers, <laughs> as you can assume. So, did you hear about the order? Yeah. So, oh, I. I really don't want to say too much. I, so what we're, um, I'll just give the context for what our next speakers will, will be talking about. So it's basically an attempt to uh, see if we can um, get more empirical data on content removal on social media platforms. Uh, so we've looked at uh, content removals on, um, on, on pages in Sweden, in, uh, in Germany, uh, and in France, YouTube uh, and Facebook, um, um, accounts belonging to media uh, and politicians. Um, yeah, okay. Um, and can you do one more? Go ahead, one more. <clears throat> 
so these are the um, so, so here you can see uh, w what we've done, the methodology of uh, of the analysis. We've looked at these three countries: uh, media on Facebook uh, and YouTube, uh, politicians, uh, and then we have uh, three experts who you'll meet uh, in a second who have coded sort of to look at the 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 contents that are being removed. How many of those constitute punishable illegal speech under national laws? How much is it is speech promoting hatred but it but is deemed not illegal how much of it is derogatory speech how much of it is general expressions of opinion and how much is incomprehensible uh, or, or uh, spam um, so so this is um, and, and the reason why it's interesting to look at the number of deleted comments uh, and how much of it is punishable or illegal speech versus other types of speech is because the narrative that we often hear is that these platforms are uh, awash with illegal speech, and that is one of the main reasons why governments are, are cracking down on them. Um, but um, does that correspond uh, to reality? And there are some methodological uh, problems. We cannot tell the, the deleted comments whether they come deleted by the by the users or or the, the or the platform. So that's that's one methodological uh, issue. But what you will see is. Um, First of all, there's a huge difference between removal rates in the various countries. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. And um, you will see that perhaps the most interesting thing is that the vast majority of deleted comments were just general expressions uh, of opinion, uh, w whereas uh, punishable illegal speech, de speech comments that were deemed uh, uh, illegal constitute a very little portion uh, of the uh, deleted comments. Um, but to give us more insight on this, I will uh, give the floor to uh, our, our, our first speaker, Joanna. We'll focus on. Hello. Hello. Are you mic'd up? Oh, she is. Okay. Our first speaker has examined the understanding and regulation of freedom of speech in France and the United States, to name a few. And I want you to welcome the associate professor of Baltimore University, ready at any second. Here she is, Joanna Turkuchutiri. I killed that. Yeah. I killed that. Hi everyone, I'm delighted. It was the best name ever. Thank you. <laughs> it's Turko Horiti, <laughs> but I'm used to it. So I'm delighted to be here and it was a real pleasure to participate in this project when Jacob and Natalie invited us. Uh, so what we did is we double checked speech that has been removed, that had been removed for, for platforms to see if it actually should be uh, illegal under the state of the law in France. I have done research in France, so I know French legislation well. Uh, so let's see what the results are. So I have to emphasize, so we opted in favor of the most expansive interpretation of the law possible, and yet the results are astonishing. So you saw the slides, some of the slides, oops, it's not moving. Yeah, so those are some of the slides that Jacob also engaged with pre previously, so you will see the percentage of deleted comments per country and platform. You can see in red the percentage of punishable speech. Let's move on. You can see the amount of general expression of opinion among deleted comments. It is very high in France for Facebook and YouTube. And let's move to the next one. Let's move to the punishable comments. There. So as you can see, it is about 12.5% uh, of the comments that were removed from YouTube are punishable under French legislation, and about 8% of the comments removed by Facebook are punishable under French legislation. Can we move to the next one? Okay, so... Derogatory speech. So as you can see there, the percentages of derogatory speech from the speech removed from Facebook is about 9% and 15.1% for YouTube. So French legislation in this area is particularly strict. And in the area of insult and defamation, it foresees penalty enhancements when defamation takes place because of a person's origin or belonging or not belonging to a specific ethnic group, 
nation, race or religion, or because of a person's sex, sexual orientation or gender identity. So several instances of speech that should be limited um, met the conditions of the relevant legislation there. Several instances of the speech that were actually limited met the conditions of the relevant legislation. So we detected cases of racist insult, anti-Semitism, homophobia, as well as cases of group defamation on the grounds of religion, ethnicity and sex. Uh, France also prohibited the publication and dissemination of fake news, of false news. Um, and several instances that uh, we detected were related to this clause, to the relevant clause. It also for, for, for forbids the denial or challenge of crimes against humanity. Um, and several statements were found to meet the conditions also of the relevant clauses. So speech was found to constitute apology of crime or of Nazism. Can we move? And you can see now the amount of speech uh, promoting hatred among deleted comments. And that's, this is extremely important. It is about 1% of the comments removed from Facebook and about 3% of the comments removed from YouTube that met the requirements of the law of incitement to hatred and discrimination. France has very strict legislation in this area as well. Um, in the area of incitement, French legislation prohibits incitement to discrimination, hatred or violence against a group or a group of persons because of their origin or of their belonging or not belonging to a specific ethnic group, nation, race or religion. So some remarks now about this whole picture. Um, so the evaluation of whether he, he, speech should be limited at all as constituting hate speech is context dependent. And of course, artificial intelligence presents several imperfections in this area. At the end of the day, we need a human being to decide whether speech is harmful or not. Uh, so it's extremely important to th think about those conclusions and those findings in relation to the Digital Services Act, which was enacted recently by the European Union. So this piece of legislation foresees a complicated system of evaluating uh, the content moderation that the platforms engage in. And for the act to be enforced properly, we need further research in several areas um, of its application. So first of all, research is required into whether it is possible to elaborate algorithms that do not return too many false positives. So I'm sure AI experts um, know better this area. The research that I had the opportunity to come across um, indicated that moderation technology is not accurate. At, at least artificial intelligence is inaccurate, unfortunately. And it is not certain at all whether uh, speech, hate speech detection algorithms are capable of detecting all nuances of speech. Um, and in addition, the current models, as they operate, reproduce numerous biases. So those models are used in the area of hate speech and in the area of, of misinformation as well, in order to, de to detect fake news. So they are based on natural language processing, uh, which picks up several cultural biases about gender, race, ethnicity and religion. And to date, as far as I have seen, and I look forward to hearing from Jesse, who I'm sure knows more, research by scientists has shown that it is impossible to entirely debias algorithms. So this is particularly relevant in the area of hate speech as much as in the area of misinformation, as we said. Um, and under the DSA, the platforms are required to offer enhanced internal complaint handling mechanisms and the DSA also foresees the possibility for out-of-court dispute settlements. And it foresees for the creation of new national and European bodies that will oversee its application. So those authorities, the national digital, digital services coordinators, will play an extremely important role in enforcing this piece of legislation. So those are independent administrative authorities that the EU requires the member states to create. So, what does this mean? At the end of the day, they will play an extremely important role in evaluating whether hate speech or misinformation has been properly removed or not. And um, this means that local community standards will carry great weight in evaluating the quality of speech and whether it meets the standards of the relevant legislation. So, there are, it's extremely important also to do research in several other ways uh, that may be appropriate in limiting hate speech or in addressing the problems that hate speech raises. 
Um, it's worth exploring whether paraphrasing technology might be an interesting solution in this area. And we also need further legal research to explore whether this technology may actually be helpful or not, and whether it raises concerns under international human rights law. So is it preferable to use paraphrasing technology um, over limiting speech? If we limit speech, then we will have several legal avenues available that the DSA affords to those whose speech is limited. Uh, out of court, uh, internal, so the, the legislation asks the platform to create systems of investigating complaints by citizens who think that their speech has been limited and they Oblige the, the, and it also obliges the platforms to provide the possibility for out-of-court dispute settlements. And at the end of the day, it's very likely that those independent administrative authorities will be set as bodies that will be also evaluating those types of complaints. And of course, national courts all over Europe also have jurisdiction in this area in evaluating similar complaints. So the question is, is paraphrasing technology a good solution or are there other, other human rights concerns that arise. So if you're paraphrasing somebody's speech, uh, instead of limiting them, if you're limiting their speech, then they have so many other legal avenues. If you're paraphrasing them, they're not even aware that you're paraphrasing them. So it's definitely worth engaging into legal research in this area, in research from the perspective of legal philosophy as to whether those uh, avenues could be acceptable or not. And also, we need research in social psychology to evaluate the effect of exposure to hate speech online and to, ev to evaluate also the practices of extremists once blocked from online social media platforms in order to be able to implement the legislation properly. There is some early research in this area and I, th and I think Jacob has engaged with this research, but I think it's very pre preliminary. So let me stop here and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. I will say her name also, Les Persian. Tukuhutiri, Joanna. Thank you so much. And moving on, on this same subject, of course, our next speaker is a senior lecturer in constitutional law at Uppsala Universitet, which is here in Sweden, and will present research on content moderation. Please welcome Mikael Rotsi, our next speaker. Thank you. Ah. Yes, and while the presentation gets started, I could just add that, well, as Jacob mentioned, the whole survey is basically a sort of a, a double snapshot thing, where you take a snapshot of the, of the comments on certain media channels or social media channels at one point of time, and then a few days later, you take another snapshot, and then you can compare which of, which of the comments posted have been deleted. Um, what that, of course, doesn't tell you is why they've been deleted, and it doesn't tell you uh, by whom it's been deleted. And that's not my PowerPoint, but <laughs> yes, very interesting. Um, and I can also add that, uh, well, my job in this uh, survey was to review the deleted comments from on the Swedish uh, social media um, channels and to assess whether they were potentially punishable or not. Now, let's see if we can find it. Yeah. That's the same, actually. How disturbing. Um, should I, could you, could you hook up my computer? If, if unless you, I mean, if you can't find it. But, Do you wanna yeah, sh yeah, we can take Martin first. Yeah, no problem. About this, so we will take uh, Ferbman's uh, presentation. Is maybe on there? Just give me a second to introduce you. <laughs> maybe you can find his while we wait for Rotsi. So we will take our third speaker now instead, and we will come back to Mikael Rotsi in a bit. Our second speaker will instead focus I on um, oh German and European content moderation. He is at the University of Hamburg as a doctoral candidate. Please welcome Martin Ferbman. Possibly with Thanks. your presentation, yes, nice. With the uh, presentation in place, looks like, and the clicker here. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to uh, try to give you a brief walkthrough through the uh, German leg of uh, this study for which I assessed 2,000 comments that were removed from uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook, so 1,000 each. Um, just starting us off with a little uh, overview, maybe. 
um, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the notion of illegal content in Germany, which is actually not as straightforward as you might uh, think. There's one very uh, eminent uh, regulation that has been in place in Germany for a couple of years now that has also influenced the current state of platform regulation. Uh, afterwards, we'll go over to an overview of the result of actually assessing these pieces of content, discuss the results and uh, conclude. Uh, first of all, on the left here, uh, we see uh, not just GQ's uh, best dressed man of Germany 2016, but also a uh, former uh, Minister of Justice in Germany, uh, Heiko Maas, who is the father of the uh, Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, very short and concise German name for legislation uh, that is usually abbreviated as NetzDG. And um, the idea of this uh, regulation that has been mentioned already, also been criticized already, also by some members of the audience in the, under the, their uh, previous mandates, uh, um, uh, the essential idea of this uh, regulation is still um, to fine platforms for their failure to remove illegal content when it happens at a systemic uh, scale. Uh, what does it actually mean? And this is what I want to point to before jumping to the results. Illegal content here is understood as content that fulfills certain sections of the German criminal code might seem straightforward, but actually it isn't at all, because usually when you think of criminal law, it always covers intentional, sometimes negligent human acts, but never content as such looked at in a sort of isolated manner. And this is something we'll have to, to bear in mind also later on. Um, the NetzDG is going to be repealed on, in February next year with the full entry into force of the Digital Services Act we've already uh, heard about, but it sort of still remains relevant because it is in large parts uh, inspirational also for, for the DSA. So although there are significant uh, differences, it is very influential. There's also a report by uh, the Future Free Speech actually from 20. 19, I think, on the influence the Nazi has had globally called the uh, Digital Berlin Wall, which you might want to look up. Interestingly, in the DSA, we face a similar idea that we look at illegal content as any information that uh, is not in compliance with a member state's law. Um, this is sort of um, similar, maybe in some parts a little bit uh, better to handle because it's uh, more vague, but uh, very echoing this idea of the Nets DG. And then we also uh, see this idea in Recital 12, where it says uh, illegal content as a concept should broadly reflect uh, ideas also of criminal law, the existing rules in the offline environment. So we face this challenge of using this uh, criminal law that in large parts not specifically targeted to cover content, online content, and uh, making this work to assess pieces of content actually. And we face a lot of questions. So for once, usually, as I said, Criminal liability requires some kind of human intent, or at least negligence. What do we do with these requirements? Are we going to have to investigate intent? I think Nicola already alluded to uh, your definition of, of uh, mis- and disinformation and meta, and that it's very hard to actually uh, require intent for uh, running a content governance system at scale. So we might actually want to do away with intent, but uh, then we go on and we ask ourselves, about, about the objective criteria, what, a, for example, uh, something that is said has to be a proven falsehood for German malicious gossip uh, criminal liability. Um, do we still require this provenness of the falsehood or actually suffice maybe if it just seems very unlikely and is very hurtful for the person? So we might also want to get rid of some objective criteria and then in the end, um, when it comes to real-world threats, for example, someone is approving of a crime that was previously committed, what are actually uh, the requirements in terms of has this crime that is being approved of actually happened or not? Are we uh, really wanting to investigate all the context in order to determine this? Or are we sort of taking a probability-based perspective and just say, yeah, well, this video looks pretty bad. Uh, it seems likely that the crime has been committed and someone commenting, yeah, well, this person deserved whatever happened there um, uh, suffices for us. So just to say that actually, uh, while it may sound straightforward to say criminal law applied to content, actually it's not straightforward at all. Um, and this task is also what we took on with this study. So um, for Germany, I looked at these uh, 2,000 comments um, and found that only uh, less than 1% of them actually were in violation of German criminal law in relation um, to those uh, provisions covered by the NetzDG. Um, if you uh, look at the breakdown here, you see that uh, the prevalence was uh, 
much higher on YouTube than on those uh, comments removed from Facebook. And the uh, Yellow Press uh, newspaper build was heavily overrepresented with uh, uh, accounting for 85% of the uh, unlawful comment while they only uh, contributed 48% uh, percent of the overall comments that were in the, uh, of the overall pieces of content and associated comments that were in the sample. Um, and then, yeah, I, like the individual German criminal law provisions, I think I will spare you with... Uh, because I don't think that holds much analytical uh, water to look at them here. But um, what is interesting to me is looking at the comparison to uh, France and Sweden. Of course, we've already had heard from uh, uh, France. So we see that the r removals of all the comments that were uh, analyzed, the removal rates were highest in Germany, while simultaneously the percentage from those removed comments that were actually illegal was the smallest. So. Uh, this is like a common criticism of laws like the Nets DG um, that uh, these laws create risks of over removal by companies who want to avoid sort of uh, uh, risking administrative fines and err on the side of caution and over removing. So um, this moves us on to the discussion for which I would uh, like to make at least two points of caution. One is that we didn't investigate the prevalence of illegal comments in all content that was on the platform, but only within a sample of comments that were removed. So um, what we can talk about here is especially um, what the reasons potentially were for higher or lower incidences of illegal comments among those that were removed. And this leads to a lot of complexities. One is, of course, differences in criminal law. And that was why I had this sort of precaution at the beginning of transposing criminal law to online content. Differences also in the transposition of criminal law to content assessment, uh, which is simply not a straightforward task all the time. So secondly, uh, we also have to account for the possibility that on certain platforms, pages or countries, there might simply be a higher prevalence of uh, content that is illegal, so you might think there's worse uses, um, but also the possibility that you simply remove more, um, so more of the illegal content, so simply we, we face better enforcement and therefore we uh, find the differences. Also, a possibility which sort of dilutes this is that there's simply more enforcement of content that isn't illegal, but also catched in the court in the sample, uh, leading us to having a smaller proportion of content that was actually illegal. Um, so, um, j just a few points to raise, and of course this is all preliminary, um, but just a few points to, to, to uh, raise the actual complexities of, of um, addressing this, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, as we had earlier, especially uh, at scale. So, to conclude, I would say, are there hints of over-removal in Germany? Maybe, but we'll have to uh, use larger sample sizes and also develop our methods probably further, because um, methodological caution, especially because we have these very, very large country differences. And we also face this as sort of a reflective point, if you will, that studying content moderation at scale, actually, we produce a lot of the issues that we always criticize with content moderation at scale itself. Um, and I think this is an interesting point for us researchers because it's very easy from the outside looking in to always uh, require that everything uh, matches sort of the high uh, standards of uh, legal assessment in a court of law ex post when all the facts are clear and investigation has occurred. But going down the slippery slope of actually doing a, a preliminary assessment with little knowledge base and then making a yes or no suggestion if something is illegal or not actually requires trade downs we have to uh, become honest with, uh, which is interesting but also challenging. What we definitely see is that these kinds of rules that just say, yeah, well, take criminal law, apply it to content and see what you need to remove, are uh, very harmful. We need uh, legislative instructions or at least a scientific consensus on how do we actually do this. Otherwise, uh, it's basically uh, to some extent a turkey shoot. Um, on the other hand, the DSA is a great chance in this regard, because now we have uh, this definition of illegal content that is applicable union-wide. So now we can actually collaborate also as researchers and uh, try to develop some typologies on how can we actually use this concept of illegal content and uh, create some uh, coherence across different uh, member states. And that's something I, I really look forward to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin Fertman, developing, developing typology and methods for this research. As you plug in your, your material, I can present the speaker that should have been before. 
It is our speaker from Uppsala Universitet. I know he has some students here with him today. He is a senior lecturer at constitutional law at Uppsala Universitet. This is Mikael Rotzi. Thank you. Thank you again. So let's give it a good, another shot, shall we? Um, yeah. So I have investigated the Swedish part of the survey. And uh, for some reason, I can't. Oh, here we are. We're fine. So. Um, I just, if we have a look at the, the social media channels included in the survey for Sweden, um, it's interesting to note, I thought that um, with, with the Facebook uh, channels, we have, uh, you know, individual politicians, Ulf Kristersson, Abba Bush, etc. But when it comes to the YouTube channels, uh, we've investigated political parties. And I, I wasn't really clear why we had done that. But when I started looking at it, I realized that Swedish politicians don't have YouTube channels which is, uh, sets Sweden apart from the other investigated countries, apparently. And it's also interesting to note that um, if you look at the, the numbers, Sweden has very few, at least comparatively speaking, deleted comments. From the other countries, um, you know, the other researchers examined 2,000 deleted comments on each, on Facebook and uh, YouTube. But for Sweden, we only reached 800 deleted comments. So why is that, one might wonder. Well, if you look at the number of total comments on Facebook, quite significant for Sweden as well, 175,000. But if you look at YouTube, only 19,000 comments on the selected channels. And that sort of uh, interested me. So, so I, I had a look at which comments were deleted. And if you looked at Facebook, um, about eight, about 700 of the deleted comments were from the media Facebook pages. I mean, not the politicians' Facebook, but from Aftum Ladet and so forth. And if you look at YouTube, of the 800 deleted comments, more than 700 had been posted on the YouTube channel belonging to um, Ritz. So basically, the other YouTube channels had no deletions or very, very few. Which is, which is an interesting fact to note. Um, it's also interesting to note that the proportion of deleted comments was uh, very much lower in Sweden than in Germany and in France. Um, I suppose you could find different reasons for that, but um, it's, it's difficult to tell, especially since some of the accounts used in the Swedish uh, survey seems to be not very active when it comes to commenting. And that could, of course, have implications for this as well. On the other hand, it could also be uh, related to what, um, what Martin was speaking to about the Nets, DG, and other things. It's difficult to have any you know, certain conclusions regarding that. And well, what was deleted then? There's also, this is also sort of an interesting uh, distinction between YouTube and Facebook, although when we speak about YouTube, we're basically speaking about Rix, keep that in mind. But um, when, it, when it came to Rix, then a lot of the comments that have been deleted can be sort of um, widely described as derogatory or sort of insulting or, you know, in tone and not being very polite and sometimes even uh, semi-racist or whatnot. But on the other hand, when we turn to Facebook, uh, I mean, the overall conclusion is that the deleted comments were basically spam or things, you know, even bot generated one could, you know, suspect when looking at how they were formulated, formulated very similarly and really not uh, having anything of interest to say more than, oh, you, I saw your post, you're an interesting person, would you follow me? Stuff like that. So huge difference in that sense between Facebook and YouTube comments deleted. And uh, when it comes to the potentially punishable content that was deleted, which is what my primary, you know, examination was about, it's it seems that you know, for some reason, the percentage on Facebook and YouTube turned out to be pretty much the same. About five percent of the deleted comments were potentially punishable, and as um, as Martin has also set out so eloquently previously, it's, it's sort of a difficult determination to make because what you have is of course language and the thread where the comment was found 
there's a certain lack of context and there's also a certain lack of, you know, subject. You don't know what the person posting the, the post was intending to say. You only know what words actually came down on on the thread, so to speak. So there's a uh, there's an element of uh, uncertainty, but, you know, still, you, you can probably say for certain that uh, the proportion is low, regardless of who would have. If I had done the uh, determination or someone else, I think, you know, there could be some variance, but probably not that much. So, um, yes, some some remarks. Well, the number of contents on, on YouTube is sort of um, interesting. Uh, that, that only Rix had a, a, you know, a large number of comments on, on, on YouTube. I, I'm not sure if that says something about the, the YouTube culture of Sweden or if it says something else, but it was really striking. Um, and as I mentioned before, I got up on stage the first time. Well, when it comes to you know the deleted comments, it's really difficult to tell um, what that actually tells us about content moderation because this survey does not allow us to say whether it was deleted, whether the comment was deleted by the, the platform, by the the provider of the of the, the channel, or by the user himself if he you know, changed his mind and deleted the comment. So that that makes it difficult to draw any you know certain conclusions about why things may have been deleted and by whom. And like I said, Facebook comments deleted were essentially spam, while the YouTube deleted comments were essentially insults of some sort. And when it comes to the, um, the potential crimes that um, I located, one can say that on YouTube and Facebook, you had some cases of potential defamation, you had a few cases of threats, but the most prevalent sort of criminal offense that was could have been committed by the comments or in the comments was found on YouTube, on the Rick's channel then, and was sort of, you could call it hate speech in, in Swedish. The, the relevant criminal provision is, called, provision is called agitation against the population group, Hetzmot folk group. So at least 30 plus instance, instances on the YouTube channel. And you could also, of course, talk about what we did not find. Um, and there's a lot of things that we didn't find, but some things that you know you could have been uh, that have been talked about previously. Today concerns terrorism content, and of course, there was no terrorism content found here under the perhaps the EU terrorist content online act or something similar. No. And why not? Well, I think if you look at the sort of spread of the channels that we were investigating, I don't think they were places where you'd expect to find terrorist content or terrorist you know, glorification or something like that. And other very common crimes online, of course, are grooming and other kind of sexual crimes, which you couldn't find either. Again, that probably relates to the sort of media channels that were included in the survey. But um, yeah, well, to sum things up, I guess you could say that um, if content moderation is motivated by the purpose of removing illegal content, well, you know, this survey sort of gives no real ammunition for that kind of content moderation because the, the deleted comments only to a very low proportion contain potentially illegal content. On the other hand, platforms and content providers can, of course, have legitimate reasons to want to moderate both spam and derogatory comments. Uh, which seems to be what has been happening, at least in the Swedish uh, scene, to a, to a large extent. Yeah, I think that's pretty much what I have. Thank you. Thank you. And now, if we can all assemble here on stage, the previous speakers can have a seat. And I will welcome our guest from Google Sweden to comment on these findings. We have her here, Sara Övreby, the head of public policy at Google Sweden. Give her a warm welcome. Hello. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Now we have an additional seat for you. I remain standing. Yeah. Martin Furtman is also with us. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, one more. <laughs> we have a chair for Martin. Thanks. Okay, great. And Sarah and I, okay. 
Okay, Sara, we uh, before we dive into all of your questions, you can load them up. We will hear Sara's comments from Google Sweden. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for having me and uh, coming to Stockholm in this nice winter weather. Um, I think that this survey, it's, it's so hard to know where to start actually, but I think that this survey was super, super interesting because we work a lot with the, the issue, or I work a lot with the uh, demands for content moderation and the discussions around content moderation from a regulatory point of view, uh, whether that's in the in conjunction with elections or if it's in conjunction with the development of the DSA and other legislative proposals. So I thought it was very fascinating to to see your results and also just from a Swedish perspective, see what selection of channels and um, and uh, pol politicians that were that were uh, for, for subject to investigation, so to speak. Um, if I just uh, spontaneously reflect upon uh, on the results, I think that my my initial when I just saw the numbers, so to speak, uh, of, uh, in one way, rather high rates of removal, I thought that looked like a very good sign that we are successful in our attempt to, to take responsibility and remove uh, illegal content, according to Swedish law. I, I will speak as a Swede because that's what I know best. Uh, or content that breaks our policies at YouTube. But then looking in deeper into your uh, numbers, there was a lot of removals that were not in accordance to either being illegal or in accordance to our policies. And that, on the other hand, got me a bit worried. So I think you very clearly said that it is not clear who has removed these comments. And I would like to state from our point of view at Google and YouTube that we remove one of our um, we have the four R's, we call them. So how do we handle content on our platforms? And in this specific case, YouTube. So we remove content that breaks Swedish or any other EU country's law uh, or breaks our policies. And what do I mean with our policies? That's um, denial of historic events, which is also law in some EU countries, but not in Sweden. It's hate uh, against um, sexuality, ethnic groups, um, where you are from. It's... Um, threatening somebody, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there are very clear uh, rules of the road. As my, uh, the, the colleague from Meta, she spoke about also not re uh, spreading content that is on the fringes of either the law or your policies. And that's something that we also try to do, that just because you have freedom of expression and YouTube's mission is to give everyone a voice, we don't have to spread it to everyone. So that's another measure that we take to make sure that we don't spread uh, comments or information that is um, on the bordering line. And then in challenging situations, like in a big election, a war or a pandemic, we raise up content that we think is extra important for our users to see. And that can be uh, directed to the health authorities in Sweden or where can you vote so that you know, or if something, we have had Quran burnings in Sweden, so when that happened, we had breaking news shelves that it's not um, a bypasser who's filming that you get access to their analysis of the content, but a news media um, or a publisher's content. So that's the, all of these things apply, and I guess that the core issue here is actually who did remove the comments. And um, one reflection I made is that under the, uh, the, the enforcement of the DSA that is ongoing, I guess that hopefully one of those, uh, exp like the additional access for researchers into the platform's um, moderation uh, work stream, so to speak, that that could be one of the solutions to trying to find the answer to that question. Um, and um, other than that, I guess this is just something that we would need to continue to follow and look into, because I guess I heard the panel say this as well, that we are we are very worried about over-removal uh, as per ambition to give everyone a voice and also trying to safeguard freedom of expression uh, around the world. Mm. And uh, so that's something that is will be interesting to continue to follow. So we look forward to the full report also and, and to continue to discuss. Yeah, exciting. Now we have our microphone colleagues on the field. But first, I think Jacob has some initial yeah, yeah. comments. <clears throat> well, first of all, I, I again want to thank our, our three uh, experts uh, for, for, for doing this hard work and, and some of it uh, reading comments that might not necessarily reach uh, 
the level of uh, great philosophy uh, <laughs> going through that. I just want to some some more contextualization. As 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 mentioned rightly, there are some methodological limitations on on the on, on the conclusions we can draw uh, from uh, from from this, and I think that's really important that that you all stress that. But we've also done similar things in a Danish context, which showed the the, the similar similar results. Uh, and we interestingly, we've also done one on Danish uh, uh, Facebook, where where we also looked at the number uh, at the comments that were left up, and where the the um, where the amount of illegal comments were left up were less than one percent. Um, so 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 I, I think um, at least you know if we can't draw firm conclusions, I think it is defensible um, to at least say that the. This this narrative that drives much of the conversation that illegal content is flooding these pl these platforms is uh, at least lacking a lot of nuance, and that you could uh, also you uh, you could make an equally strong claim that the real the real problem is over removal, depending on you know your your approach to where the line should be drawn uh, on on free speech, because uh, obviously you could also say that it's unproblematic. That these platforms remove uh, content uh, that is legal, but may not uh, create a an atmosphere that is conducive to um, to to uh, um, conversation. I will say one other thing, which I think points to to over removal. So, if you go to the Future of Free Speeches uh, web uh, website, we we published a report earlier this year called Scope Creep. Um, where we looked at the hate speech policies of eight social media platforms and how they've developed since their first iteration. Mm. Um, and there you see a clear tendency for the expansion of hate speech policies so that they include categories, uh, protected ca characteristics um, that go far beyond um, international human rights law standards. So if you, know, if you go back and look at David's reports that he's, he's written about you know, how to apply Article uh, 19 and 20 of the ICCPR to uh, to social media content moderation. You will see that the stand that that the the the, the policies of uh, of YouTube, of, uh, of Facebook, uh, TikTok, and so on, all of them prohibit much more as hate speech than what would be you know if you adopted an international human rights law uh, framework. So that also I think can shed some more light on on the findings that 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 you come up with suggesting uh, that that actually that there might be um, over removal by by the platforms that they do remove more than uh, than, than than illegal uh, content I remind you you can ask questions we have our friends here with the microphones we have one in the back but first Martin Fertman uh, yeah, just a very uh, short thought on researcher access because we uh, also mentioned it today already a couple of times and just a perspective on, from Germany on that is actually that uh, sometimes it seems like a, a mm, like a pill that solves every problem, but really it, it hasn't in, under the NetsDG at all. Um, we've we've had research access clauses in the NetsDG for I mean almost uh, yeah almost seven years now, and I'm not aware of any uh, study that I mean, without wanting to ignore some colleagues, but uh, that that meaningfully made made use of it in in the way I would assume. And I think Google hasn't received a NetsDG uh, research access requirement at least until last year. I'm, I'm I, I I think so. Um, yeah, I think the the struggle from from the academia side on uh, research access clauses also that we don't really have sometimes the methodologies, the funding, and the collaboration between uh, empirically working people and legally working people to get these studies off the ground and then make these uh, research access requests in a meaningful way. So while it helps to have these provision in place, sometimes I think the bigger problems are actually not even the the access provision themselves. Uh, first, I just want to uh, leave some space for you, Sara, if you want to either reflect on that, but I also also want to hear specifically the the very low amount of deleted comments in Sweden that Mikael Rossi pointed out and the maybe over representation we don't know from the channel Rix I don't know if Mikael explained what Rix is but it is the channel operated by Sweden's Democrats the right party alt right party even in Sweden no, I think that's a combination of, of what you mentioned thanks for clarifying the part of of our policies potentially uh, taking a what do you call it, a, a more, a broader approach to what should be protected uh, characteristics or um, categories, uh, because we do. And that's something we, we do with, with, with the 
that we're aware of that we're doing and that we chose to do just because as, as also was mentioned before that uh, we want to be a welcoming platform and people should have a good time when they when they join our platform and if that's the case that is because of our policies going further than Swedish law or international human rights and uh, that could potentially be the reason for for RICS having a lot of I mean first of all they have a lot of comments and seem to be a bit alone with that and we can only regret that nor, not more politicians are on YouTube reaching the young population but but uh, but I guess that uh, if we are removing uh, hateful and uh, threatening comments that's something we that we want to do are you satisfied with that answer Mikael yeah 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 very easy to satisfy Mikael Otzi we have a question in the back as well from Mikael Bang Peterson our colleague from Aarhus University yes uh, th thank you so much this this question is also directed to uh, to the Google representative and 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 it's also about data access because I think really at the research side then this is a this is a crucial uh, question and it and just to give sort of one example which is is not related uh, to Google but to Meta then when it comes to for example Cambridge uh, Analytica then I think the biggest scandal involved in that was that Meta used it as a pretext to close down researcher access such that it's now completely uh unclear what is happening behind the scenes and and i think again we're also seeing that uh with with the beginning of the implementation of dsa then what x with elon Musk did was to close off uh, researcher access uh as well again that's not your problem but 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 i i, I slightly disagree with the last uh question that the problem is 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 uh not just the access i think it's a major problem, and I don't see any movement in any positive direction from the platforms. Uh, and I, 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 I would very much like to know what what concrete steps are you taking to actually help researchers look into what is happening behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think that that so my my sense is that uh, that uh, a number of myths that are floating around in public debate. Uh, would be busted if we, in fact, uh, were able to scrutinize. Uh, so I'm not even sure that um, that it would be a PR uh, catastrophe for the social media platforms. Thank you, Mikael Bang Peterson. Um, I will have to come back to you on the concrete measures, but overall, I think that we as platforms have a huge responsibility and a lot of work to do in order to explain how things work. And, I, and we are proactively uh, trying to spread that across uh, our different stakeholders in society. I work primarily with politicians, so I will have to come back to you on the academic side of things. But there we proactively try to reach out and uh, discuss and uh, share knowledge of of how how what our policies, how do our systems work? We from Google side and YouTube side, we have a big hub in Dublin, and we invite people over and arrange seminars and deep dives and and different things just to also shred light and knowledge about what is going on. But I will come back to you on the concrete task. Like in this instance, our experts mentioned that they can tell who deleted the comments. That would be helpful just to be able mm, to exactly. add on that. But also I would like to ask, uh, what do you think are some probable causes for these great differences between countries, Sara? You had some uh, analyzing uh, notions there, but I would like to hear from you as well. Yeah, I'm... I'm a I'm afraid I will just have to speculate, but maybe one can. We love maybe, that. Maybe one can allow oneself to do that. Um, no, but as I said, I think there's some difference in what is legal and is is illegal. Our policies are the same, but the rating between what is removed uh, for what reason could could then could then um, be one of those reasons. I think one one issue is uh, is the amount of comments as well. I think that is, was an interesting interesting. Um, point that you had, Mikkel, on, on why are there fewer comments in Sweden? The, the, the French YouTube community seems much more vibrant as well as the German one. Uh, I think that there was a bit of a difference between what type of channels that were subject for the study, and I'm not sure if that was because what criteria made the selection, so to speak. Um, but from my basic knowledge, I think it was more established channels in France and Germany and less established actors in Sweden or less part of the establishment, as one sometimes call it. Um, so that could have made a difference as well. But um, 
I have no deeper analysis than that, unfortunately. Can there I, are no uh, general ideas about user culture, political culture. Yeah, potentially. Can I come with some motivated reasoning slash conspiracy theory? <laughs> we love that too. <laughs> uh, so, so one uh, one possible uh, reason um, um, could be that both Germany and France have more restrictive laws, uh, which uh, creates more uncertainty about the limits, which might again give a you know a um, uh, more doubtful cases where you remove to be on the safe side. It could also be. Uh, that both, you know, Germany has its net CG, so that could be one. Uh, France tried to pass uh, a similar law, the AVA law, which was struck down by its uh, constitutional uh, council as, as violating free speech. But France has been very, the French government, obviously being a big player at the EU, has been very active in pushing back against big tech. So that could be another reason why maybe if you're a tech company operating in Germany and France, you might be... Uh, inclined to remove more uh, content there than uh, than in Sweden, where you don't face the same uh, de uh, degree of pushback and where you don't have the same, um, um, you know, where it doesn't maybe flow into with the, uh, to, to the EU system in the same way. But as I said, that is uh, speculative and, and motivated reason. But I will say, in, in terms of the DSA, what, what I think would have been useful is, you know, start out with the transparency obligation, researcher access before you then adopt um, the the obligations to remove uh, illegal content. Because then you, if you have that in place for a number of years, you get a better of idea of what kind of problem, what's the scope of the problem we're actually facing? How much illegal content uh, is there out there? And are the, are the instruments that we that we are that we are adopting are they proportionate to 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 the problem perceived? I think that would have been a better way to go forward. First, let's have some transparency. Let's let have researchers look at it, uh, and then you can adopt legislation on an informed background rather than now, where it's sort of you know at least you have some members of the commission using it as as sort of a a, a tool to 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 um do pr um with 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 unintended harmful consequences for online free speech here we just want to let in michael rossi yes i just wanted to add that i mean i i mentioned a few methodological limits to the survey but i mean i didn't do that as a critique against the future of free speech or their, oh, for their survey so too. but i mean i think it also it falls back on on the social media platforms and their lack of transparency yeah which i mean yeah. must sort of affect how the study can be done so yeah but I think this is also speaks to something, like you were saying, that this project should initiate discussion on how methods are done and probably with corporations. We had a question here from this lady. Yes, thank oh, you. Yes, uh, so this is Dee from the Oxford Internet Institute. And my question, actually like two questions. One is for Jakob. Can you unpack more on how the coding scheme is designed in, in terms of like, what do you mean by punishable content compared with illegal content? And the second one is, did you identify whether, like which country the, the deleted comments were uploaded in the sense that if a French user sent a comment on a Swedish like political channel, how does that transnational content uploading or like, is there any jurisdiction specific requirements, which jurisdiction's laws is the comment subject to maybe also from the platform perspective, yeah. Very good. Yeah, so uh, at least in, in to, to the first uh, question, so the, the, the punishable slash illegal content is based on the, the applicable uh, law um, in the countries. So that's where the three experts come in. They, def they, they define um, the, the laws and they are the ones who are doing sort of the, um, the assessment of, of each comment uh, in question. Of course, you know, um, as, as, uh, as was mentioned, there's an inherent uh, uh, uncertainty in this. If, this if, if these comments were being assessed in a, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a court, uh, you know, the person in question would have uh, an ability to, you, you, that person might be interrogated first. They, you might not bring a case because you find out, well, the context was this and that, uh, and, and this does not reach the threshold. Uh, so, so, so that's, you know, an important caveat uh, to keep, uh, to keep in, in mind. So it's a best effort attempt to sort of uh, assess whether the comments in question would violate or violated uh, national uh, law, but obviously should not see, be seen as an authoritative 
uh, statement on whether the specific law, uh, specific comment in question did in fact violate the law and, and that person uh, could have been uh, punished under it. I, I don't have a good question to answer number two. I wish that Annalise and tell uh, the, the Danish data analytics company that that that, that has um, designed this were, were here today, they could give you more uh, information, but please do reach out to me um, and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to try and, and answer you in more detail. Uh, Joanna, do you want to add something to the conversation? Yes, maybe I to wanted to say something in relation to the rationale behind the DSA at some point, because Jacob alluded to that earlier. Um, so the platforms have been practicing content moderation since 2016. Uh, when the EU elaborated a, a code of a deontology code on hate speech, and this code took the form of a contract that the EU signed with several major major platforms. But the concern was within the European Union that uh, those platforms were maybe limiting much more speech. So platforms are private civil society actors and maybe they are limiting speech, much more speech than what it would be acceptable to limit in Europe, where limits to hate speech are acceptable to a, great ex to a greater extent than what is the case in, in the US. So to some of the philosophy behind the law was also uh, to control uh, the circumstances under which the platforms exclude users. Uh, and I think platforms would also apply some behavioral criteria previously, and those criteria were seen as opaque by the European Union. This is why they have implemented this system where if a user is to be excluded, they have to be notified first. So, so it's interesting. So the, e, the DSA is presented as a piece of legislation that enhances speech, but then its application is, is so complicated and there are so many technical difficulties in actually implementing it and applying it. And we need so much further research, so it remains really to see whether it will apply properly or not. So, yeah. Sara, do you have any reflections on that? Do, or anything else you want to comment on? No, no, I I was thinking, no, just on the DSA, I think it's very important that we just, the, um, what do you call it, the benefit of, of a, an EU regulation is that the regulation is the same in all EU countries and trying to operate a global platform that helps to have 27 rather than, uh, one rather than 27 different ones. But we also need to make sure that implementation becomes harmonized across the EU. And then I was just thinking about all these regulatory requirements because we're actually, the EU is just about to finalize its negotiations around the European Media Freedom Act. So while the DSA regulates what, how we should remove things and in, in, in what way, uh, the European Media Freedom Act is trying to regulate what we need to leave up. So there are, are, we have kind of contravening or contradicting requirements on us as platforms, which also makes this landscape uh, difficult to navigate and also alluding to what has been discussed here today, a worry about over-removal and challenges mm. in allowing free speech and, and everyone's voice to be heard. I think this uh, research really highlights a lot of key um, issues, regardless of country or political culture, and I hope you get a chance to discuss together. And we have Meta here also, and a lot of different uh, political scientists here in this room today. I think actually I want to keep Jacob for a bit, just to say goodbye to everyone on stage, if we can do that. And we thank the panel, the second panel of the day for being here and sharing all this with us. Thank you so much. And if Jacob, you wanna join me in closing the day, because we have been filled with insights and research and data and conclusions. And now what to do with this? How do we move on? Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, being a brilliant moderator. Um, so much fun! Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, you you've really done a good job navigating little uh, technical mishaps, uh, and uh, but we're only fifteen minutes um, uh, late, which I think is by any conference standard a, a great success. So thank you very much. Should we? Uh, I'm sorry yeah. about the fifteen <laughs> minutes. <laughs> um, and, and I really want to thank uh, all of you who come. Many of you travel from abroad to be here uh, uh, today. It's been a great crowd. I've, well, you know, I've not only enjoyed a lot of the comments um, uh, today, but also just walking around the room, listening to conversations, connections being made. And I hope that some of the research uh, insights uh, that have been shared here today can, uh, can help others in their work. And, and hopefully if that people uh, can connect uh, and that we can uh, work on solutions uh, that will uh, enhance the, uh, the commitment to free speech while at the same time uh, trying to mitigate some of the visible harms that, uh, that, that is challenging uh, that very 
uh, commitment. So thank you for being here. Uh, please stay in touch. Uh, and uh, it's been a privilege. Thank you so much. I share that. Thank you so much. And grab one of these sheets to try the um, free equalizer. Yes, please do try the, 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 the free equalizer. Come up uh, with your... Uh, your, your hate speech, but more importantly, your counter speech, uh, <laughs> as it's, it's a work in progress. Thank you. Thank you so much for today. Bye-bye.